Number 10, George Chapman. Starting off with George Chapman, we're going back to the late 1800s for this piece of work right here. He began his career at first as a Polish doctor, but in 1888, he moved to London, and that's when things got a little more dicey. Once in London, Chapman sought out four mistresses. Not three, not two, not a side thing, not four. Let's do four at the same time. George Chapman was a doctor, a cheater, and a killer. He poisoned all four of these women with arsenic. It was terrible. Chapman himself was executed for these crimes in 1903, but we're still talking about them because this guy was so bad, they thought perhaps he might have been Jack the Ripper, but that's since been proven otherwise. So yeah, imagine someone being so bad, they're like, maybe, maybe he was Jack the Ripper. Maybe he was just another horrible individual. Who knows? Number nine, Arnie Cheyenne Johnston. Okay, this was the famous Devil Made Me Do It case. If you've watched the new Conjuring sequel with the same title, this should all ring a familiar bell. Well, it's based of course on a true story, all that's real. Back in 1981 in Brookfield, Connecticut, Arnie was convicted of first degree manslaughter and the victim was his landlord, Alan Bono. Now, prior to this, about two months prior, the Glatzel family witnessed their son David host a demon. Right? David was behaving strangely, the family was confident this was the work from the devil, so they called in the pros. They called in Ed and Lorraine Warren. Now this was a process that lasted days, and witnesses say that the demon that fled out of the body of David was the same that took over Arnie a few months later. The same demon that made him attack his landlord. Yeah, Arnie was convicted and he served five years out of a 10 to 20 year sentence. Yeah, he was released on good behavior. Number eight, Albert Fish. Albert is one of the oldest people on this list. He was dubbed the Brooklyn Vampire, or the Moon Maniac, or even the Boogeyman himself. It's clear that Albert was a terrible human who did terrible things. I can't really talk about some of the stuff, but yeah, given those nicknames, you can piece it together. In the early 1900s, Albert was arrested, tried, and convicted for killing, and then doing other things with these people, horrible. But the horror was not over at that point. No, Albert began to claim that although people knew about three, the actual number of casualties was closer to 100. And he even claimed that he had some in every state. So that's disgusting. And to make matters even worse, as if it wasn't already terrible enough, this deranged lunatic also sent a letter to the mother of one of his victims. He sent a letter detailing everything about how he lured the victim and the rest of the horrific details that occurred afterwards. Number seven, Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay, Jeffrey's one of the most well-known serial killers with his crimes taking place, of course, from 1978 all the way to 1991. His crimes are far too brutal for this channel, but he's known for taking the lives of 17 different people. At his trial, not only did he plead not guilty, but his attorney, his attorney had some interesting words for the court, some interesting things to say. His attorney stated that his bloody pattern had caused him to believe that he was the devil, which was intended to bolster his insanity plea. Odd take, but sure. Again, the devil made me do it type of bullshit. Now his attorney said that he became enamored, overwhelmed, dare I say caught up in the character from the movie Exorcist 3. Said character being Satan because he was the personification of evil. Not only was Jeffrey found to be sane and ended up being sentenced to multiple life sentences in prison, but not too long after his sentence started, he was killed by a fellow inmate. I wonder if the devil made him do it. Number six, Richard Iceman Kuklinski. He became one of America's most prolific killers after being hired by the famous five families in New York City, okay? He had around a 30 year career as a contract killer and while he only ended up being charged and convicted for four killings, that's still a lot, but he had claimed that the actual number was close to 250, so yeah. When we think of what an assassin would look like, he may not be at the top of this list, which may partially be what helped him be so successful in the first place. While he killed his victims in a multitude of horrible ways, he was dubbed the Iceman due to the fact that he froze all of the bodies. This was to ensure that the coroners would be unable to determine their true time of death, right, and really figure out who was doing it. Richard ended up passing away in jail in 2006. Yeah, we know the time of death for that one. We know that one very well. The Iceman, check it out, it's on Netflix. It's a good documentary. Number five, get to work. Also speaking of movies, you know that classic scene where the prisoners are out on work duty, everyone's in their like orange jumpsuits, they're cleaning up all the garbage? Okay, that, but ancient. A lot of criminals, thieves, and no good rotten folks were used for hard manual labor. Pretty classic. And you guessed it, 
building the pyramids. While the pyramids are often misconceived of being built by YouTube's least favorite S word, it was most likely built by a combination of people, mostly crafted skillsmen and builders, followed by crooks and those wishing to get out of the hot, hot sun. The job was dangerous, hot, like I said, and oftentimes heavy lifting. Too much for me. While normal workers were granted two days off a year because it is backbreaking work, the criminals were tasked with quarrying stone with no days off. No machines, no iron tools, I mean it's all, oh man that must be awful. Just the horror. <laughs> just, just the worst. Number 4. Tarnished Reputation This one actually makes a lot of sense really. Depending on how heinous the crime is, you wouldn't want this for stealing some bubblegum. So if you found yourself in hot trouble or the principal's office, which I was never in for being a bad boy, I was good every single time, I promise. No one believes me still, but I, I was. The vizier or government would keep track of who's been sneaking the tombs like Laura Croft. Hence, they could use this information to tarnish your reputation. It was also used against false witnesses and those wishing to gain something from a legal situation. Those that wish to bear false witness would immediately have something amputated because that's the law around here, partner. Number 3. Fair Pharaoh The great Pharaoh Bacchus is an interesting subject to say the least. First off, I had to say his name a couple times before I really understood what was going on there. I blame this Alexia, but that's just how it goes, baby. But secondly, he's the guy that takes power and goes, whoa, 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 guys, maybe not so harsh. And I use this term lightly, but he improved human rights, specifically improvements for prisoners who owe debt. Hmm, sounds like someone might have owed someone a few bucks himself, hmm. Interestingly enough, his laws were influenced by Greek laws, who then influenced more Greek laws, who those Greek laws influenced Roman laws, who then influenced our modern law. There's a, there's a big chain of events there, trust me, it all matches up. Number two, your nose knows. Knows to stay out of trouble. I saved this one for the bottom of the list because, well, it's just so awful and weird. In a town called Rhinocolora, not too far from Cairo, but 200 miles, was a town full of people with no noses. What? I know. This wasn't a Red Skull Comic Con convention, but a penal colony of sorts. Maybe the first. These people were or had been accused of thievery, and for this they had their noses removed to show anyone who visited what kind of people they really were. In a world of infection and disease, I cannot recommend this. It's not a good idea. You, you probably wouldn't make it after they removed it. The name Rhino Cholera, which literally translates to Clip Nose, the town of Clip Nose. That's that's not good. Number one in God's hands. Remember before I mentioned the priests used to handle verdicts? Well, it's crazier than you might think, actually. While the Pharaoh was top dog in ancient Egypt, and I mean he was top dog, you don't, you don't get past the Pharaoh, the gods controlled everything and the Egyptians worshipped their gods. Crops, weather, justice, I mean they did everything. So oftentimes the priest's verdicts would come down from the gods themselves. If that wasn't enough, the god Mahis was responsible for those criminals in the afterlife where they would also receive comeuppance. Uh oh, you're not safe anywhere. A sort of jail in the sky if you will. Alcatraz has nothing on that. You're bad here, you're bad in the sky, you're bad everywhere, bad in the afterlife. So that's why folks, you behave yourselves. Keep your nose, behave yourself. Number 10. Man eats underwear to avoid breathalyzer. In Alberta, Canada, there was a man in 1985 by the name of David Zerfle. He was pulled over by RCMP officer for weaving on a snowy road after apparently drinking one night. He then decided to run from police after being pulled over on foot. It's literally every cop's dream. They're just in there, please run. Please run. Yes! Of course they caught him and booked him for what intended on being an impaired driving charge. Whilst in the back of the cruiser, of course, David ripped the crotch out of his underwear to eat it. A uh, couple things here. How do you even get that down? I can't swallow a Tylenol without choking. Apparently he didn't eat it, eat it. He spat it out after a while and was just kind of chewing on it. His theory was that the cotton might absorb the alcohol content before he got to the station to do a proper test. Which when he got there, he was acquitted of all charges and blew a legal respectful .8. He did it. I mean, first off, dick move for driving though, that's not cool. Very dangerous and very selfish. Best part comes weeks later at his hearing. Just so happened a group of grade 11 and 12 law students watching the hearing as a class. Just, you know, teenagers giggling the entire time. Of course they were, they were teenagers. Order, order! Did you stuff your own tidy whities into your mouth? Objection, your honor, leading the witness. Number nine. Spider hostage. Look, I don't, I don't like spiders. This next guy on our list doesn't even respect spiders, okay? Paul Brian Smith, the man who has three first names. 
Back in 2012, Paul agreed to watch a friend's pet spider, which on paper at first I'm like, hey, gross, but I get it, that's awesome. A little bit of Home Alone vibes going on there. When the friend came to collect said furry friend, Paul held the spider ransom. Said if he didn't get $100, he'd swat the spider. <laughs> he swat the spider. Sounds like a, like a Spider-Man villain there. Like J. Jonah Jameson. But I'll swat the spider. In turn, Paul received 40 months in prison for burglary, theft, possession of drug paraphernalia, and more. Yeah, there may or may not have also been a person hiding in the closet when cops came around. This one's really bizarre. Can't really talk about the weird, awful extra details on this case. Paul Brian Smith, give it a looky once you're done here. Also, save the spiders, they're good. Number eight, a bath salts Christmas. An Ohio Christmas miracle. Sounds like a Christian rock group. A man by the name of Terry Trent was charged with breaking and entering a home at Christmas when he uh, was arrested very high on little more than just Christmas spirit. The family arrived home and saw the man sitting on their couch watching some Christmas shows. While dad's on the phone with police, the man apologized, thanked them for his stay, and calmly left. Family said that the man apologized after lighting a candle, fixing up their wreath, relaxing on the couch, and finishing up the last Christmas tree decorations. Ah, the spirit of Christmas. The guy's the opposite to the Grinch. Dude, this guy's the real Santa Claus. I hope you're all good. He's coming in to do his check-ins. Police arrived and said Terry didn't cause any problems, went in with them calmly and quietly. See, guy just needed some Christmas company. Wanted to catch Mr. Bean's Christmas special. Who wouldn't? That could have been really, really bad and turned out to be a zombie apocalypse Christmas dinner, but thankfully it did not. Also, it's Christmas. I've seen my aunts after some wine. It's pretty well the same thing, isn't it? Number seven, photobomb. I love a good photobomb. I dug this one out of the archives. This is from six years ago at a bar. I'm a big fan of rooting a beautiful moment between two other friends. Friends? These are my friends. Sometimes photos catch great moments. Sometimes they catch not so smooth criminals as well. Back in October 2010, a Wisconsin man got caught trying to steal a tourist bag. This guy was caught in 4K. While he was stealing the bag, the owners of said bag were taking a selfie a few meters away. He's in the background taking the bag, just clear as day. It's so funny. He immediately was sentenced to five days in jail, obviously. The 69-year-old man's name is Glenn Lambright. Pretty ironic last name, seeing how easily he was caught. Mr. Lambright was also fined $500. Guy just gets caught in a boomerang. Number six, dances with lions. 32-year-old Maya Autry of Bronx, New York was caught on camera at the Bronx Zoo apparently taunting and dancing in the lion's exhibit with a lion. She apparently calls herself the Lion Queen and she has been seen on camera not once, but twice, dangerously close to these cats inside the lion's exhibit. She's lucky that this thing is tranked out of its mind, just chilling, bored. People will do anything nowadays for the gram. She's throw some cash, threw a dozen red roses and dance for the lion. You know, dinner and a show. The lion has been praying for a day where someone gets this bold. Apparently she gotten herself into the exhibit before and was handed a citation prior and a year ban before returning again. Two counts of criminal trespassing. The video is great too, the lion's just sitting there. He's like, so uh, you coming in or not? You just gonna stand there? Hey, you know the uh, score of the Knicks game? No, all right. Number five, fire leg. Ever sit down at the holiday dinner table and your uncle's cutting the turkey and says, are you a thigh man or are you a leg man? <laughs> Except he says the same thing every Christmas and you can't wait for him to say it because that means you're another second closer to not being there. Anxiety's a heck of a thing, man. I don't have anxiety that bad. I'm just trying to relate to some of the people out there. I feel like I've been there with you. I don't know. Well, this was no Christmas and this certainly was no turkey, but people were talking about here. Yeah, we're talking about people. When someone was found to have done a serious enough crime, but not serious enough to be unalive, the authorities met in the middle by taking a leg. Oh God, that's awful. Now some of you might be thinking, well, I guess it's not that bad. You, you lose a leg and you move on, but imagine being held down and someone hacking your leg off with a bronze tool because steel doesn't exist yet. Oh, it's awful, awful, no good, no painkillers. Number four, homework. Homework, homework, homework. Homework, homework. Love it or hate it. Well, I actually hate it, and so did most of my friends. Some say it's needed in a modern world to teach efficiently. Some argue it doesn't do anything at all. I did my homework 90% of the time, believe it or not, and I know some, some of you are gonna comment and say, oh, Chetty, no you didn't. I did, I really did. But when I didn't, I would usually come in and charm my way out of it. Hi, Mrs. Middleton, you look great today. You're the best. It worked most of the time, what can I say? 
Usually on the, usually on the female teachers, it didn't work on the male teachers so. though. But the worst that would have happened is that I would lose a percent off my grade here or there, but I just make it up back on the test, no problem. Well, scribes in ancient Egypt weren't so lucky. They were very important as they were literally the writers of the time. They, they described the history. It's pretty cool, actually. However, if they chose to stay up all night and play Call of Duty like I did, well, their punishment was a more of the violent physical variety and not so much the stern talking to or I'm going to phone your mother variety. My mom didn't care. Number three, caning. Another creative punishment for crimes was caning of the feet, which is actually arguably the worst thing on this list. Since, you know, we use feet every time we walk or do something, you're gonna need a spa treatment after this one. A very simple process, the person is strapped down, feet exposed, a governing official then takes as many lashes to the feet as required. Painful, humiliating, and possibly dangerous. Cuts could lead to infection as we're walking around in heat, sweat, and well, some folks, if you were poor enough, just didn't have shoes. The worst I ever got was a couple minutes in the timeout corner, except that my mom felt bad because I looked really cute and I was sad and everything was fine. No spanking required. I was a good boy, I promise. There's some people don't think I was a good boy, but I really was a good boy. Number two, barbecue. I feel like the moment humans discovered fire, well, that fire hurts, we wanted to throw everything in it and see what happens. Now, I jokingly call this segment barbecue, but that's because it's really horrible. Famously, a group of rebels in ancient Egypt were immolated after trying to overthrow the pharaoh. Where after the barbecue from hell had finished, the pharaoh used these rebels as human torches. I, that's, oh, wow, okay. All Fantastic Four jokes aside, it was horrible, smelly, and cruel. Don't ever do this, please. Number one, adultery. Surprisingly, one of the most punishable crimes in ancient Egypt was being unfaithful, partly related to the lifestyle of Mahat and being truthful and just. It really makes sense. Just be a good boy. It makes a lot of sense, but some people don't follow that. The whole thing is bizarre because, well, no one really followed it, especially the royals. I mean, they had kids with their sisters and brothers and cousins and, and others and all, uh, just, it's messy. However, some folks did find themselves caught in this law, and when they did, they could succumb to anything on this list. For women, it was most likely the torch. For men, it was impalement and then being tossed into the river because, you know. Better keep those love notes to yourself, folks. Not worth getting burned over. It's it's not worth it. Just keep these off. This doctor can only prescribe doom. It's Dr. Harold Shipman. Shipman has been a well-respected and like general practitioner and considered a pillar of the community, the way that all good serial killers are. Until another GP surgeon began to get suspicious of Shipman's patients having a high mortality rate. It was then revealed that Shipman had been killing dozens of his patients, actually 215 to 250 to be precise, and had done so for years, almost completely undetected. In fact, some believe his count may actually be closer to 500. Shipman killed remorselessly, but it's likely he only ever did it for kicks and thrills and knowing he was getting away with it. Shipman was caught after suspicions being raised after a will from one of his patients he killed cited him as the sole heir, cutting out her own family. Shipman forged this will, his ego thinking somehow he'd get away with it. Of course it would make sense for a stranger to leave her whole life to me. Her doctor she has no personal relationship with. I'm me, I'm perfect. Shipman was found guilty for 15 murders and one count of fraud, being sentenced to 15 consecutive life sentences, and he took his own life in a cell in 2004, never confessing to his crimes or giving a reason for all the overcompensating granny theft. Fire festival, but make it 16th century, the Badavia. Alright, so this has some Lord of the Flies energy for sure. The Badavia was a ship bound for the West Indies carrying 341 people, a mix of civilian soldiers and working men. So tensions are high from day one. Lot of dudes, not many chicks, no firm leading hand to guide the ship socially, and then wham, ship crashes on June June 4th of 1629. They had managed to rescue some of the provisions from the wreck, including barrels of biscuits and some water, but the commander Pelsat and some crew ditch these 268 other losers and go find fresh water and help, which takes them 33 days to reach. In the meantime, those 33 days on the island are enough for Cornelius to decide to build a weird empire. Firstly, he tricks a party into believing that water could be found on the Seals Island. Upon landing there in their little ship, the group found no water. Cornelius then sends his henchmen to finish them off. Next, he drowned people by sending them out in boats on useless errands where his accomplices would push them overboard. Then, he instructed a group of soldiers under the command of Weeb Hayes to go explore the High Island. Before they left, he confiscated all their arms. He didn't expect them to return. After all, that was the same direction which Pelsat had gone 30-some days ago, and he never came back. Lo and behold, a smoke signal means Hayes did 
find water, which complicates matters for Cornelius. He was in danger of them warning any approaching rescue ship of his Lord of the Flies actions he'd been doing. He tries to woo Hayes over to the dark side. Hayes says, nah bro, island living. So Cornelius tries to duke it out and loses spectacularly to Hayes, who locks his ass up. Pulsat takes 63 days to find the wreck site again, almost double the time it took the ship's boat to get to Batavia. When he arrives, he learned of Cornelius had killed and pilfered and enslaved those around him and condemned the mutineers to have their right hands cut off, in the case of Cornelius, both, before being put to death on gallows. Double trouble with these sisters, Delphine and Maria de Jesus Gonzalez. Doesn't that just roll off the tongue? At least a lot better than most prolific murder partnership, which is the title given by the Guinness World of Records in a dubious honor to their horrific 91 known slayings. They shopped from home, pulling victims from the brothel El Rancho de Angel that they ran in Mexico. There's not much information on the Gonzalez family, despite the fact that the sisters were actually caught alongside their two other sisters who were seen as accomplices, and that their crimes were committed in the 21st century, where police and scientific progress can provide a lot more detail. The police picked up a woman named Josefina Gutierrez, a procuress, on suspicion of devious behavior in the Guantero area, and during questioning, she implicated the two sisters' crimes. Police officers searched the sisters' property and found the bodies of 11 men and 80 women, a total of over 91 people. Investigations revealed the sisters' scheme was that of to recruit women through help wanted ads, though the ads would state the girls would become maids for the two sisters, not adult services in a brothel. Many of the girls are force-fed substances once they arrived, and the sisters reportedly killed the girls when they became too ill, too physically damaged, lost their looks, or stopped pleasing customers. They would also do anything to customers that showed up with large amounts of cash, asked too many questions, saw too many of their girls, or were just kicking it around too much. And when asked for an explanation for deaths of family and friends, one sister reportedly said to people, the food didn't agree with them. Both received 40 year sentences in 1964. This would probably be the worst plumbing call to ever receive, so let's visit Dennis Nilsson. As a miserable junior constable in London, he began to drink alone in the evenings and began visiting gay bars where he engaged in casual liaisons with other men, having fought the long fight of accepting his own sexual identity. A year later, he left the police and began to work as a civil servant in a job center. Between the years of 1978 and 1983, Dennis Nilsson is known to have killed a minimum of 12 men and is believed to have attempted on further seven people. At first, Nilsson kept the bodies under the floorboards of his Melrose apartment until they had decomposed too much to gain gratification from, and they emitted the gnarly scent of rotten person that attracted insects. He therefore decided to burn all of them in a bonfire in his garden, disguising the smell with a melting car tire too. In mid-1981, Nilsson's landlord decided to renovate the ground floor apartment, offering him $1,000 to vacate, which he happily accepted before burning the last few bodies he was retaining. Dennis moved to 23 Cranley Gardens in London, where he went from a floorboard storage to attempting to dispose of flesh organs and smaller bones by shoving them down a toilet. Seeing as toilets can't even handle a tampon, it consequently blocked all the pipes, which surprisingly led to Nilsson himself calling an emergency draining company. Imagine that poor employee looking down the toilet bowl and having an eyeball look back. That's essentially what happened too. When the plumber noticed the blockage, human remains and immediately called the police, putting an end to Dennis Nilsson's murder spree. Hotel Hell was also called the HH Holmes Hotel, and it was literally built with the single goal of killing folks for sport. My American Horror Story fans may know, but this legendary building is the inspiration for their season Hotel, alongside the Cecil, of course. While it remains unknown how many people Holmes killed in this house of horrors, he once boasted of killing 27. However, some estimates claim the actual number could have been as low as 9, or as high as 200. Like I said, there ain't much info. For his mansion, HH Holmes planned the first floor to contain an entire block of storefronts that he would be able to rent out to the flood of new businesses opening in the city. The third floor would contain apartments for new residents looking to make it in the big windy city. Eerily, for some of those unsuspecting residents, they may have eventually become homes as victims. Those victims got to see the second floor, one that was allegedly full of asphyxiation chambers and mazes and hidden stairs. There were hinged walls and false partitions. Some rooms had five doors and others had none. Secret airless chambers were found underneath floorboards and iron plate lined walls of appeared to stifle all sound. The first clue about this bizarre floor plan's true purpose came to the cops in a pile of bones. And when the authorities descended into the cellar, the scope of the building's hidden horrors were revealed. Beside a blood-soaked operating table, they found women's clothes, surgical surfaces, a crematorium, and an array of medical tools and bizarre devices. For the most part, Holmes represented himself at his trial, displaying his classic grace and a remarkable familiarity with the law according to one paper at the time. However, his charm wasn't enough for the jurors and he unanimously
infamously was sentenced to death. Number five, fleeing. This is straight up a crime, man. I don't care what you say. This is just a crime against humanity. I'm not here debating on how governments get rid of their, let's say, more interesting members of society, but this is not it. Popular in the ancient world for whatever reason, and I can't stress this enough, I would faint from watching. I was shivering writing this. Seriously, it's the worst. This is the act where someone is skinned alive. They're held down and peeled back like a potato. There's multiple famous incidents like in art and mythology. I just, I just don't know who sits there and one day and goes, ah, you know what, this guy? Yeah, we gotta skin this guy. Let's just skin him. Let's just let's cut him up. Let's go. Number four, the eagle dropping turtle. Okay, here we are. Top of the food chain. We're in charge. I'd like to make the argument it's not the things we eat that puts us there, but it's the things we don't eat. Think of all the animals at your favorite local Chinese buffet. Well, we as humans have adapted so much that we can survive and choose not to be carnivores or eat certain animals. Where am I going with this? Well, despite us being number one, sometimes the animal kingdom fights back. That's kind of how it works. Take Aeschylus in 455 BC, for example, a philosopher who found himself being struck by an eagle dropping a turtle onto his head. Unfortunately, the injury was fatal. Since we're talking about Greeks and philosophy, let's bring in a little law here. This is good, you'll like this. Mens rea, actus rea. While the eagle certainly didn't know he was committing a crime, he still did do it. Sounds like someone needs to go to animal court. Hmm, that's something they would probably do back then. I mean, they did medieval times. They put animals on court, so why not back then? Number three, Draco. No, not Malfoy, not Draco. Draco Malfoy, I know you're all thinking it, that's what I thought too. Draco, the lawgiver of ancient Greece, was a man with modern solutions for their modern problems. He was asked to give a code of law to replace the very aged tribal feuding laws that still existed at the time. Commoners were shocked to find out that even trivial crimes could wind you up in the brazen bull, or uh, not breathing anymore. Uh oh. However, the wealthy, of course, loved these laws and applauded Draco. Classic villain story. They really loved it, so much so that it was Draco's undoing. As the legend goes, Draco was buried in a small mountain of clothes, hats, and garments. He suffocated under the pile of compliments. The accidental fatality of the man who gave us strict laws that are fatal. So, what do you, what do you charge? You, 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 you get in trouble for undoing the guy that's supposed to undo? That's, that's weird. I don't know. Number two. Ooh, Prometheus. Oh, mighty Prometheus, what wise knowledge of fire do you bring us today? The story of Prometheus is that of a very dark and tragic one. He was the god who gave humans fire, despite Zeus's wishes not to. Well, given Zeus's temper, he wasn't too pleased when he saw people grilling up their Slovaki. Love me some Slovaki, man. Naturally, Prometheus had to pay. So, Zeus did something so awful to him, well, we still talk about it today. He had Prometheus chained to a rock where every day, at the same time, a large bird would come down and eat his innards. Just come and mm, just nom nom on his, on his insides. Gross. Since he was a god, he had Wolverine like healing abilities. But he wasn't immune to pain. It would still hurt. He'd heal every day, but. It would hurt really, really bad. Number one, Sisyphus. I think this one is relatable to everyone, including myself. Unless, of course, a large bird does rip your guts out from time to time, or you've been skinned alive, then, then that one's more relatable. I doubt that, though. Sisyphus was the king of Corinth and had cheated his meeting with the Grim Reaper one too many times. This made Zeus mad. So he sent in Sisyphus to push a boulder up a mountain forever. Every time he gets to the top, it just falls back down. And if that's not a metaphor for life, I don't know what is. Number two. 10, punishment first. Innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, right? That's that's how it goes. How do you know I drank the milk? <laughs> There's no milk on my face, how do you know? There, there'd probably be milk on my face. Not so much in ancient Egypt. While there is some evidence of jails existing, it is clear that they much preferred an immediate and swift justice. By that, I mean flogging, mutilation, removing limbs, uh, that sort of thing. A lot of these punishments were overseen by a vizier. In today's terms, it's sort of like a governor or official who had the power to oversee things like punishment through. Or at least held the most power besides the pharaoh, which, hey, that's a lot of power. While it may be an effective system for keeping prisons empty, no one should lose fingers for sliding a couple double bubbles in their pocket. That's just my opinion. Number nine, prisoners. While the promise of losing a limb, the second you're caught taking a cookie from the cookie jar, boy I've been there, is a great deterrent, prison can also work sometimes. It should be noted that Egypt developed a system of law and order 4,000 years ago, which is, well, a long time ago and very impressive. For anyone taking the bar exam, that should be your answer under why take on law. 
Because the Egyptians did it first, why not? They did it, it's probably cool. So it makes sense that they did have some prisons. There's depictions of prisoners and drawings and figurines, surprisingly, oftentimes having their arms bound to their back like a good episode of Cops. And a leash around their neck with ropes and, uh, well, it just looks a little strange and weird. Given that most criminals were done on the spot, it's not hard to imagine that the Egyptians were cruel to their prisoners, and they were, it was not good. They should be canceled, that should be canceled, them. Number eight, court. Believe it or not, they also had some sort of makeshift court as well. Who would have thought? No hammer and gavel, and certainly no Saul Goodman or Judge Judy, but hey, without those, I'd argue what the heck's the point of the American justice system in the first place, right? Ha oh boy. But they were simple processes, to say the least. During the Middle Kingdom period, judges were appointed to decide on verdicts before well, it was usually priests, so I, I, I prefer a judge doing that, honestly. Except in this court, no one is legally represented by anyone. Yeah, that's right. There's no lawyers, but there was a jury and there were witnesses. Unfortunately, they were often beaten until, well, they said the truth, or uh, the desired truth. Number seven, police. Bad boys, bad boys. What are you gonna do? Yes, that's right. Ancient Egypt may have had the first police force in history. Who would have thought? I actually didn't know that. I mean, sure, the vizier is great and all, but he can't possibly go around arresting everyone. He'd be at this all day. He can't do that. So it's only natural that you hire a bunch of dudes to do it for you. Can't get them all, but you can get some of them. While they did provide some limited support to communities and crime in towns, most of their arrests were made against those who were a little too greedy and thought grave robbing, well, the many sacred tombs around would make for an easy payday. It didn't. Number six, Bloodhounds and Baboons. That's a weird title. This one is so weird, but okay, here we go. We've all seen the movies where there's a crook, a perp, or someone who's trying to outrun the law. Andy Dufresne was right. You gotta crawl through a lot if you want your freedom. I remember Andy Dufresne. Anyway, well, in these scenes, there was a good chance that law enforcement has dogs with them. Oh, yes, yeah, see, I'm getting somewhere with this. There's also a good chance that those dogs were bloodhounds. Cute dogs, actually, but the reason they bring them along is because they have a great nose. They can sniff a scent and follow it for miles, oftentimes leading to the crook. Smart dogs. What if I told you though that this sort of thing existed in ancient Egypt, except that it wasn't dogs, it was baboons. Yeah, who would have thought? Yes, that's right. There's depictions of police with baboons assisting in the work with crooks and or criminals. It's all jokes until Diddy Kong shows up to arrest you. Now it's DK time, baby. Uh-oh. Hey, number five, Pedro of Castile. Pedro of Castile was doing as the European monarchs do. Sometimes you gotta marry for alliances. Sure, it makes sense. Your kingdom is much less likely to get steamrolled by a larger kingdom if you have an alliance with fellow kingdoms or the bigger kingdom itself, actually. Pedro of Castile married the young Blanche of Bourbon of France, and so Spain could just be a wee bit more snug you know, in case the English come over. You gotta be careful. But Pedro just wasn't having it. What he was having instead was a mistress named Maria. So instead of enduring a loveless marriage, he had poor Blanche locked away in a tower, just like Sleeping Beauty. Except a handsome prince was not coming to rescue this damsel in distress, uh, but a man with a black hood and a sharpened axe. You know what I'm talking about. As Pedro had her unalived. I was gonna make a joke about Rapunzel and let down some hair so she could make an escape, but I mean, that's just, that's just awful, really. Imagine being locked up in a tower for so long. Sure, I love the indoors, but you gotta let me out at some point, chief. Do you think I get food delivery apps to work up in a tower? Because otherwise you have to let me out, dude. Comic Con's coming. Anime Convention North's coming, buddy. I gotta go. I gotta get gotta get my Naruto on, bro. Come on, man. Number four, hands-on funeral. This one's just gross. When you're in a relationship, it can provide you with some great things. Someone to go through life with. Companionship. Love. And if you're lucky, someone who's a good cook or a baker. Oh, love me some baked goods. Mm. However, also in a relationship, sometimes you do more than that. Sometimes you get a little close under the sheets, if you know what I'm saying. Take King Philip V, for an example, who loved loving his wife so much that, he, well, he just couldn't help himself, you know? Like, for instance, when his wife tragically passed away, he wanted one last, um, one last ride. But he penciled in one more trip to Toe Curl City before she was laid to rest. I, I just, God, that didn't seem right, you know? It just, let her, you know, let her, let her go peacefully, you know? Let her just, ah. Number three, Lenin. Okay, while not a king in the most stereotypical sense, he did dethrone a king and made himself an autocratic dictator, which, 
is basically a cane, just modern. Trust me, it is. It, yep, trust me. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, Lennon had been anti-royal for most of his life, but after some help from some sneaky Germans and other Soviets loyal to his cause, the Tsar had no choice but to abdicate, like I said at the top of the list. He abolished the Tsar's secret police and then put in his own, mm. and had people oppressed, which was one of the main reasons why the whole revolution started in the first place. See what I'm getting at? He was supposed to get rid of the evil monarch, and he became the evil monarch. Hmm. Well, see, then a civil war broke out, and then he was worried that the exiled Tsar might escape and try to retake the throne, and, well, he had some goons take care of him, and, uh, well, the family, too. You, you can never be too sure. You gotta take care of everything. You, know, you gotta get rid of everybody. You just can't be too sure. Number two. Pope John the 12th. For those who aren't very religious like myself, the Pope is the big one. He's next to God, and for a minute there, he was the most powerful man on earth. Seriously, I mean, th this guy could crown kings. He's the king of the Vatican and the king of kings in the Holy Scripture. It's kind of serious. And today, he's got a really cool car for parades. The Pope Mobile is pretty sick, I'm not gonna lie. However, Pope John the 12th was anything but a sweet old man who delivers the holy messages from God. This Pope was doing a lot of anti-Pope behavior, if you will. Now, I for one wouldn't care if the man had a girlfriend or a glass of wine. Heck, some rules need to be changed, but this Pope uh, was most known for his lavish, how you say, adult-themed parties, and was known for getting hangovers. It got so bad at one point, it started a war. Number one, not so slick shady. Marshall Mathers, Eminem, the king of rap and named king of hip hop by Rolling Stones magazine. Hence he's the king, I gotcha. Despite what you think of the man's lyrics, especially vulgarity, he's an excellent wordsmith and could write rhymes that would leave you tongue twisted. However, I don't think it would come to anyone's surprise that the man's got a few charges under his belt, especially the way he talks about Kim. There's a couple, a couple of bad things he said about her, I don't know. Back in 2001, arguably the peak of his career, Eminem assaulted somebody in a nightclub after getting fresh with his wife. He got two years probation. Hmm. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is saying the things he's saying in those songs. Maybe he's telling the truth. Hmm, I don't know. Number 10, grave robbing. Probably the most infamous crime of the time and today, really. The ancient Egyptians were many things, and that included vain. There's a reason why they got Elizabeth Taylor to play Cleopatra. It all makes sense. The pharaohs of Egypt were buried with immeasurable amounts of treasures. Gold, gems, jewels, swords, cats, dogs, just about everything but the kitchen sink. Once the tombs were sealed, the treasure was also sealed in there forever, or so they thought. That was until some crafty thieves broke into the tombs and slipped away with the loot. When a lot of Egypt was being discovered in the 1920s, it was unsure if the loot had been taken 10 years ago or 1,000 years ago. There's not really a way to know. And yes, it still happens to this day, and yes, it's awful. Leave it in there, it belongs to them, please. No more, no, no loot, Tim. Don't go loot, Tim, please. Number 9. Bribery Given that Egypt was one of the greatest civilizations the ancient world ever saw, it makes sense that they had it all. Currency, law, order. However, sometimes, well, sometimes these things just don't mix. Ever seen Better Call Saul? Yeah, exactly. They had a good system for the time, and it was fairly concrete. However, like concrete over time, there's little tiny cracks that form, aka bribery. Oftentimes when facing serious charges against the pharaoh, there was an option to opt out of your sentence, just open your wallet and dish out some cash. This has worked in ancient Egypt, medieval Europe, 1920s America, and today. Say what you will, but the almighty dollar does have buying power. Number eight. Unaliving. If women of the evening partake in the world's oldest profession every night, then unaliving is the second thing we ever did. It's not really a profession, but it's we've been doing it for a long time. It's pretty sad, but it's true. Sure, it's always been frowned upon, but today we have a lot of rules, laws, and regulations regarding said rules, laws, and regulations about unaliving. It's bad, don't do it. It was unfortunately more common than we think back in the day, especially amongst royals in ancient Egypt frothing at the mouth for the throne. But this is something that could have happened to anyone. Plus, in the time before CSI and guys throwing off their glasses to make very obvious low-hanging fruit jokes, well, if you didn't see the crime, then you probably wouldn't catch the crook. So people kind of just got away with it sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. Number seven, assassination. Related to my last point, nothing is true, everything is permitted. The creed of the assassins in one of my favorite video game franchises, at least up until they did Pirates. After that, it's... I was all kind of downhill after that. Well, despite the inaccuracies of the Assassin's Creed series has, like falling from great heights into bales of hay, the first known assassins just may have started in Rome and Egypt. 
More likely Egypt than spread to Rome, actually. Like a Sith, a lot of these early assassinations were for revenge, personal ambition, power lust, especially in the pursuit of success. Some were even part of larger plans. Now, it's one thing to be violent, sure, but to organize the destruction of a dynasty through the means of your knife? Well, it's amazing what a couple inches of steel can accomplish. Who goes there? Someone's knocking on the door. We're good. Okay, anyway, sorry. Number six, treason. Law and order in Egypt were associated with something called Mahat. I believe that's how you say it, which refers to truth and justice within society. Like I said before, great idea, great start, but more often than not, the ancient Egyptians had to fight off a lot of treason and corruption, uh, more than they like to admit it. Like when King Ramses III chose the heir to his throne, and uh, well, it wasn't who his wife had picked out, so there was going to be problems. There was a lot of wives, sons, and, and breeding, there's, con there's confusing lines. So in order to get what she wanted, she was going to stab him in the back. Literally. Well, her plot was unfoiled, and her and all the conspirators were immediately unalived as punishment. There wasn't even a burial service, as they were all thrown in the river afterwards. No amount of money or bribery could save them there. Number five, Julia Agrippina, Nero Maker. Yes, making Nero should be considered a crime. But honestly, Julia Agrippina of Rome did quite a bit more than just that, and I can see where Nero got it all from. You see, Agrippina wanted to be in power, and when her uncle, Emperor Claudius, separated from his wife due to a scandal, Agrippina saw an opportunity, no matter how messed up it seems to both us and the people of the time. Agrippina seduced her uncle, became his fourth wife, and by extension, became the empress. But it doesn't stop there. She manipulated her uncle husband into making her son Nero heir to the throne and set up a marriage between Nero and her daughter-in-law, Octavia. It's even rumored that she poisoned the food that ended her husband's life, allowing Nero to rise to power, which really bit her in the butt when Nero had her assassinated. What is this crazy family? Good God. Number four, Queen Theodora. Queen Theodora was scandalous before she even became queen. She was involved in theater from a young age, and one of her most well-known character portrayals involved her stripping down to next to nothingness. But her acting career slowed right down when she met and married Justinian I, who was the heir to the throne of the Byzantine Empire. The two of them were as thick as thieves and ruled together, but that doesn't mean she didn't have a knack for dispatching of those who threatened her position. She was scandalous, but she did way more good than she did bad. She set up houses for ladies of the night, worked for women's marriage and dowry rights, and banished brothel keepers from the Byzantine Empire. She was also a huge supporter of monophysitism. I hope I said that right. She's even considered a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church of the modern day. Killing it, Theo. That's kind of a bad joke, actually. Number three, the great she-wolf of France. Queen Isabella of France started off her queen life married to Edward II of England, who preferred the company of men to his own wife. This is obviously a precarious and possibly extremely frustrating situation to find oneself in, but she kept it bottled up and even gave birth to a son, Edward III, until it all came to a head when her husband found a new favorite. She visited France and had an affair with Lord Roger Mortimer an exile from England. But the better twist came when Isabella, alongside Mortimer and a mercenary army, invaded England, took the throne, and she became queen regent for her son, Edward III, until he came into power. She also was probably responsible for the dispatching of her husband, Edward II, while he was captured. Eventually, her son would come into power, and she was imprisoned for two years before being allowed to live a quieter life in retirement. Number two. Queen Fredegund. I was constantly double taking almost the entire time I was reading about this woman. She was crazy ruthless and all seemingly for the betterment of both her bloodline and the Merovingian kingdom. She became queen in the 5th century, marrying King Chilperic and organizing the death of Queen Gal Swintha and sending Queen Odovera to a convent. When Brunhild, a big enemy for the king and sister of the late queen, swore vengeance on them, Fredegund brutally destroyed Brynhild's husband and sisters, destroying them as in that kind of thing. The queen also made sure that all of the other heirs to the throne stopped breathing, making it a sure thing that her bloodline would occupy the Merovingian throne. 
Her son, Clotar II, was only a baby when the king met his end in 587. So, of course, this ambitious queen rose up to power, fighting battles, quelling rebellions, and ensuring the smooth running of the Merovingian kingdom in her role as queen regent. She met her end in 597, 10 years after her husband, but Clotar II continued in his mom's footsteps, having Brunhild and all her descendants removed from existence, resulting in 20 years of peace. So it's good. Number 1. Cleopatra A list of scandalous queens would not be complete without one of the most well-known and famous rulers in history. Cleopatra VII, Philopater, was the last pharaoh Egypt ever had, reigning from 51 to 30 BC. Her life was full of scandal. When she first came into power, she was co-ruler with her husband and brother, Ptolemy XIII. But that didn't last very long as the two did not see eye to eye and it started a huge civil war in the country. At the same time, a conflict from Rome made its way to Egypt as well, resulting in Julius Caesar allegedly being seduced by Cleopatra and helping her end her brother's life. And again, being co-ruler with another of her brothers, also named Ptolemy, and ending the life of one of her sisters. She was also having an affair with Caesar and even produced a son with him, who became co-ruler with her after Caesar's death and after her other brother was seemingly assassinated. <sighs> I'm so glad I was not a part of these families. Just death and betrayal everywhere. She then went on to seduce second Roman triumvirate member Mark Anthony and sided with him when Octavian and Mark Anthony engaged in the final war of the Roman Republic which Anthony lost, fighting with and alongside him until she poisoned herself to avoid being paraded through Rome and executed by the victorious Octavian. Number 10, Tyrants. This is where the name comes from, folks. So we, we kind of wouldn't have the label if it weren't for ancient Greeks. There's been a lot of tyrants in history, but this is where it all starts. A tyrant refers to an absolute leader who uses his or her power harshly and crudely, exercising total control and oppressing those who stand against the strict rulings or are a desired target of which. Ooh, very fancy definition, Chetty. I like it. Wow. The trick is seeing how history remembers you. Leaders like Pol Pot and Joseph Stalin are easily agreeable tyrants, but for example, the ancient Greek leader Alexander the Great can also be considered one. History remembers him for his great triumphs, and while that's interesting to look at, because, well, he's one of history's greatest generals, he's really amazing, actually. From the safety of our history class, that's fine, but his actual deeds, well, they were less than remarkable. War, looting, trading, YouTube's least favorite S word, and well, many, many more brutal things that the conqueror from another land did. Not good. Plus, if you were from another land and you saw him do what he was doing, you probably wouldn't think he was such a great guy. It wouldn't be Alexander the Great, it'd be Alexander the Big Stinky Tyrant. So, there you go. Number nine, Diogenes. This one's my favorite. Maybe the least famous of all philosophers, but one with a decent philosophy, or at least so I think so. Um, that's, how, that's how I feel, and I think it fits in with the modern, uh, the modern world. A man who was banished and exiled and had all his possessions stripped away. In some depictions, even his clothes. I, I wouldn't want that taken away. I gotta have, my, gotta have my clothes. Thus, the man was forced to live his life on the streets of Athens inside a barrel, as you do. This likely is what developed his his philosophy of cynicism. He argued that since he was living free of tax or payment in his barrel, that he was truly free. Thus, he had less worries than the commoners. And yeah, that's where his freedom came from. Well, where does the crime part come in? Besides, well, the obvious tax fraud there, and we're gonna pay your taxes. Diogenes might have been a few gyros short of a picnic, if you know what I'm saying. As he would often shout at passers by, and uh, well, he would, um, he would do the devil's bedroom dance solo. In public, just in his barrel there, just doing, yeah, you don't, I can't say it, but you know what I'm talking about. Number eight, Sith Revenge. Well, I know a lot of people would be behind this, especially for really awful crimes. Revenge is not the Jedi way. Sometimes it was an option for the families of those who were wronged in ancient Greece to enact their revenge on the crook. Assuming, of course, the crook was caught. You can just imagine the kind of crimes that the really bad ones, you two won't let me say. However, the important point here is that the families of the victim were given a chance to make their peace, or well, whatever the antithesis of that is, usually involving the crook not breathing anymore. 
kind of a kind of a, a blood for blood kind of thing. Sounds great at first, but I couldn't recommend it. I don't think it would, I don't think it would go well in people's conscience. I don't know, not a good idea. Number seven, Exile, a classic of the old world, just like Hellenic society itself. A common punishment for a severe enough crime was banishment. Sure, today there's lots of folks who like being alone. I, I swear most of the people I went to high school with were introverts. I was friends with all of them. I don't know why though, because I'm so extroverted. For example, Heraclitus of Ephesus. He was getting banished from ancient Greece, and it's a lot different than not being invited to Chad's birthday party. However, getting banished back then could likely see you with nothing, like previously mentioned before. Maybe not as bad or down bad as previously mentioned, like Diogenes, but still. Still pretty rough. There were lots wrong with ancient cities, sure, but you were much safer in civilization than left outside of it back then. As someone who's seen a lot of bear grills, I wouldn't recommend going out of the wild back then. A trip, fall, a cut, that's it. Whew. Number six, the brazen bull. This one is a punishment and a crime. Two in one, baby. The brazen bull to many may just look like a statue. And worst case, Ontario, maybe the horns are sharp and could hurt you. Maybe. But don't be fooled, friends. This is much more than a statue of bronze or brass colored bull. It's actually a perp cooker. It's a twisted, awful, rotten form of punishment that could also be a crime itself. One against humanity, and those are the worst ones. Basically, you open the hatch on the bull and throw your bad guy in. Then. Get a nice big fire going, really big one. The same ones your dad does in the summer. You know the ones, the ones that you can't even get too close to because it's too hot, woo. Then, wait, once steam or whatever horrible smelling vapors come through the bull's nose, that's when you know the perp is done and it's time to throw in another one. That's, that's awful, what an awful way to go. Oh. Number five, Bloody Mary, duh. Mary the first, or Bloody Mary as she is also known, was the first real queen of Britain. But this reign didn't last very long, five years to be exact, before she was replaced by the much, much better Queen Elizabeth. But in that short five year span, Bloody Mary earned that title, let me tell you. Mary I ordered war against the Protestants and slew quite a hardy handful of them for heresy. Which is interesting since her father, Henry VIII, was kind of the guy who made Protestants more of a thing in England and then her sister was also Protestant and made it the main religion in England. History is full of people needlessly passing away because what they believe isn't the right thing. Anyways, to heat things up, Mary even had some of these Protestants burned on the spot. Some is kind of an unfair statement. You see, the queen here was responsible for burning over 300 Protestants at the stake. Other kings and queens burned people at the stake for their faith. I mean, Mary's father did it, as did her sister. But it's the sheer amount of people that make her much worse and much more famous. Number four, taking over. Queen Catherine the Great of Russia was obviously a queen of Russia. But that don't mean she was actually Russian. She was actually German born. But she was Russian to get herself into power when it turns out her husband, Emperor Peter, was not very liked by his own people, as he showed a very obvious dislike for Russia, which is kind of weird. She took advantage of people's disdain, and while she may not have directly done the life ending here, it is pretty well stated that the act was committed by her supporters, and public opinion held her responsible. She was called the Great, but it seems she was actually kind of the absolute worst, even if she was a strong ruler. She does look very proud of herself in a lot of her paintings though, which, I mean, she overthrew her own emperor husband and became ruler of a country she isn't even native to. So like, yeah, I guess, good job, I think. <laughs> Number three, La Loca the Loco. Finally, a queen not on this list for ending other people's lives. No, Juana La Loca was far worse than that. Not to be insensitive, but Juana La Loca was loco. She was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband died in 1506, her father buried his body, but that didn't stop La Loca from opening the tomb and caressing her husband's non-living body from time to time. Ultimately, she even ordered people to dig up the body fully, and she would kiss her deceased husband's feet. I'm sorry, excuse me, I need, I need some water after that. That's disgusting. Mm, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh good, we aren't done. Of course not. No, no, apparently, Juana would also carry his coffin everywhere with her and even kept it under her bed. It wasn't until years and years later she allowed his burial outside her window, finally. Look, I, I get loving somebody, but dear lord, imagine what she was like when he was alive. Stage 10 clinger, 100%. Number two, let them eat cake. How about a queen that caused a whole revolution? That's gotta be a good one. 
We have almost all heard of Marie Antoinette. She was well known for splurging on things she shouldn't have and the countless affairs and scandals she was involved in. Like the scandal of the necklace. Countess de la Motte pretended to be the Queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a member of high society in believing that the Queen loved him, even going as far as to hire a lady of the night, disguise her as the Queen, and convince the poor guy that Antoinette wanted to purchase a diamond necklace that cost 1,600,000 livres, which is almost $12 million by today's money. The amount of sheer greed and debauchery that happened while she was around made her own people rise up and fight back against the unfairness of the French monarchy. Good job, you made your people hate you, cause y'all ignorant. Number one, Countess not Dracula? Born in Transylvania, because of course she was, in 1560, Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary was a Hungarian noblewoman. But more than that, she was an extremely infamous serial slayer. She used her position of power to defend herself from ever having to suffer the consequences of the heinous crimes she would commit. Okay, well, name the crimes, Adam. Okay, I will. Elizabeth spent years slaying servants and peasants just because she wanted to and enjoyed it. She did it so much that her own husband, Count Nadasti, went so far as to build his wife a torment chamber for her to do this more comfortably. Great husband, horrible person. Elizabeth also had a nasty habit of actually feasting on her prey. She would often bite and eat chunks out of them while they were still alive, and in one case, she may have even forced someone to cook and eat some of their own body. Eventually, her conduct became so appalling that a trial was held. It only took forever to happen. She was convicted on 80 counts, but was only sentenced to solitary imprisonment within her castle. That's it. Like, how is that okay? I don't get it. She thankfully met her end three years later in 1614, but my lord, was she a bad dudette. Not good. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Belle Gunness. Belle Gunness was a Norwegian American serial killer who is believed to have killed over 40 people, including her own family, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Belle was born in Norway in 1859 and immigrated to the United States in 1881. She settled in Chicago, where she married her first husband and started a family. This was all fine and well until things soon took quite the turn. Belle began to collect life insurance policies on her family family members, and if you're a true crime fan, you likely know where this is going. She went on to eventually kill them in a fire. She then moved to Laporte, Indiana, where she purchased a farm and continued to lure wealthy suitors to her property just to kill them for their money and assets. She was known for her physical strength and was able to bury her victims' bodies on her property. Belle's crimes were discovered in 1908 when a fire destroyed her farm and the remains of several of her victims were found. We love when the villain is brought to justice, but Unfortunately, that did not happen here. Belle herself was never found, and it is believed that she may have faked her own death and fled the country. In our number 9 spot today, we have Dorothea Puente. You know the saying, don't judge a book by its cover? Well, this certainly is a case of that. If you took a glance at Dorothea and knew nothing about her, you'd probably assume she was someone's kind grandma who also had some cookies and a glass of milk waiting. But that could not be any further from the actual truth. In reality, she was actually a serial killer, and she decided to prey upon some of the most vulnerable people in our communities, people who were seeking help and assistance. Dorothea operated a large rooming house that was set in a large Victorian home in Sacramento, California. The residents who would often stay there were people who struggled with different substances such as alcohol, people who had been in mental hospitals, and the elderly. All of these people were receiving social security checks and if they suddenly vanished, she figured no one would ask. In 1982, they did begin to vanish, but of course their social security checks were continually being cashed. As it turns out, Dorothea was taking their lives and then their money. She has now been called the landlady from hell. In our number 8 spot today, we have Yang Xinhai. You might be familiar with Yang already as he is quite a notorious name in Chinese criminal history. Also known as the monster killer, Yang was a Chinese serial killer who killed at least 67 people between 2000 and 2003. Yang was born in 1968 in the central Chinese province of Henan, and he had a troubled childhood. He began his killing spree in 2000 when he started breaking into houses in 
in rural areas and killing entire families. He targeted mainly farmers and migrant workers who were often living alone in isolated areas. Yang was eventually caught in 2003 after a massive manhunt, and he was found to be suffering from a mental illness. He confessed to his crimes and was sentenced to death in 2004. His execution was carried out in 2004 by firing squad, and his case is considered one of the most heinous and disturbing in Chinese criminal history. In our number 7 spot today, we have Pedro Lopez. Pedro is a man who lived a life committing some of the most horrific crimes I've ever heard of throughout South America in the 1970s. By the time the 1980s rolled around, he made a mistake during one of his awful crimes, and this thankfully led to his arrest. Once in police custody, he began to basically explain his entire life story, and he confessed to an astronomical amount of crimes. Police were a little skeptical of just how many crimes he said he committed, but Pedro was able to lead them to a mass grave where they recovered a total of 53 people's remains. Pedro, of course, went to jail, but get this, he was somehow released in 1994. I'm like, great just before I was born. Nice. He wasn't just sent home straight away and instead was sent to some sort of mental institution for three years after, but he was also released from there. So aside from the crimes he committed, are you ready for the worst part? In 2002, he was suspected of being the perpetrator of a new crime, but no one has been able to find him since 1998. Yeah, he just disappeared. That's awesome. Love it. In our number six spot today, we have another Pedro, Pedro Rodriguez Filho, also known as the Pedrino Matador. He is a Brazilian serial killer who is believed to have killed over 70 people, mostly other criminals, in the 1960s and 1970s. He did have quite a difficult childhood as his father was a notorious criminal who actually really sadly harmed and killed his mother. So this of course had a profound influence on Pedro and his life. This experience is believed to have contributed to his violent behavior later in his life, and Pedro began his crime spree at a super young age, starting with a horrific crime when he killed the vice mayor of his town, who he believed was responsible for the death of his girlfriend. He continued to kill other criminals, often targeting those who had previously wronged him or his family. Pedro was arrested in 1973 and was eventually convicted of killing 71 people. He is currently serving a prison sentence in Brazil and is known for his outspoken and very unrepentant attitude towards his crimes. While I'm sure we can all feel sympathy for the things Pedro experienced in life, it truly is no excuse for the things that he chose to do. Number five, Ted Bundy. One of the most famous killers of all time. Ted Bundy killed upwards of 30 people during his crime spree back in the 1970s. Now most interviews with Ted are extremely well known and they're horrible, but there's one interview that's very disturbing that's not as popular as the others. In this interview he's talking about taking the life of a student, George Ann Hawkins. The chilling part of it is how he talks about these dark matters just so matter-of-factly, like it's a casual conversation between work friends. Like it's not him describing the most horrible acts ever committed. She had a Spanish test the next day and she thought that I had taken her to help tutor me for a Spanish test. It's kind of odd. Now, of course, over on Netflix, you can pick a number of installments involving Ted Bundy. There's conversations with a killer. There's a movie with Zac Efron. Choose your fate. Either way, the story that you're gonna hear is chilling, so you've been warned. Number four, The Staircase. The Staircase is a classic true crime staple, one of the most widely debated cases ever, as a matter of fact. Back in 2001, Kathleen Peterson was found dead in her home. Now, this docu-series follows the investigation, a few of theories surrounding the case and the trial, but Kathleen was found at the bottom of the stairs of her home, and it's horrible, it's sad, it's tragic, and while it was originally regarded as fatal by an accidental fall that caused her passing, as the investigation unfolds, the truth gets a little more murky. Kathleen's husband, Michael, had always been somewhere near the top of the suspect list onto what happened here, considering that one, he was the last one to see her alive, and two, was actually home and supposedly in the backyard when this fall occurred. So yeah, definitely a suspect, for sure. We're gonna ask some questions. Uh, but, but, but. There's crazy theories surrounding this death. There's theories of Michael's infidelities all the way to a barn owl. There's a lot of speculation about this case and this documentary is one you want to watch if you're a true crime lover. It's, you're not really sure what to think afterwards, so comment down below. It's like there's, this is chilling. This is a really chilling case. Number three, Richard Ramirez. 
Richard, who is known as the Night Stalker, with of course a documentary under the same name. All these horrible people have documentaries. Richard Ramirez was a serial killer who terrorized the streets of Los Angeles back in the 1980s. He was known for invading homes, which actually initially made him dubbed as the Walken Killer. But he had another signature that was concerning to many people, especially during the height of the satanic panic. Richard was known for leaving behind different satanic messages at the scene of his crimes. Imagine walking in on that, that's terrifying. Because of his satanic signature, after he left his first pentagram at the scene of the crime, authorities became worried that he was a Charles Manson copycat, but instead he was just his own kind of monster. It's said that he would leave more pentagrams behind while also telling his victims to swear to Satan instead of swearing to God. And during his court appearances, he would also hold up a pentagram, and after pleading not guilty, he said, Hail Satan. So, yeah, quite horrible, I'd say. Number two, Charlene Gallego. A match made in hell, it seems. Okay, this is a two for one, so buckle up. Back in the late 70s, Charlene Gallego, alongside her twisted husband, Gerald, were the worst in Sacramento, California. They kidnapped, then they later killed 10 victims. It really was the most twisted situation. Disgusting, awful people. Cut to 1984, Charlene pleads guilty to and receives 16 years. Gerald was waiting for execution, but he actually died of cancer before meeting that demise. So, yeah, I guess nature helped out with that one. Charlene, on the other hand, she got out. She actually moved to Fair Oaks, California, and has since changed her name. You can sleep on that. Could be living on your street, who knows. And finally, number one, don't with cats. Okay, when I say this is one of the most captivating documentaries I've ever seen, I mean it, okay? I was late to the party for this one. I watched it way, way long after it was released, but from the moment I started it, I could not stop. This documentary follows the story of the killing of Lin Jun, which is one of Canada's most infamous crimes ever. I wanted to end on it because, of course, I'm a Canadian. I saw this on the news when I was in school. Lin was killed by a man named Luca Magnata, who was already stirring up some internet buzz because he was posting some pretty horrific videos before this crime even happened. As the name hinted towards, he, you know, he was with cats. It's, that's all I can say. It's horrible. The documentary follows a couple of unbelievable cyber sleuths who saw Luca's messed up videos with the cats and who were intent on finding out who he was and where he was before this killing happened. They knew it was going to get worse, so they tried to track him down and, you know, I'm not going to spoil the rest, but yeah, it's unbelievable. The crimes themselves are absolutely horrible. The story is almost unbelievable also, but the work that these sliver uh, I already said that, whatever. The documentary really has it all if you're a true crime person. It really is hard to watch because of how tragic it is and the situations are dark, but again, the ending is worth it. It's definitely worth the watch, especially if you don't know the full story. It's, they get them. Spoilers, they get them. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Luis Garavito. Luis gained a nickname from the media of The Beast, and I think that's a great indication of the nature of his atrocious crimes. He is said to be one of the worst serial killers in the entire world, and it is believed that his victim count is up in the 300s range, which is absolutely shocking. He confessed to 147 crimes, and he was found guilty on 139 of those counts, which put his sentence at 1,853 years. But here's the thing. This trial took place in Colombia, where he lives, and there is a law, or was a law, which puts the maximum sentence to 30 years. He was sentenced in 1999, meaning there's really only a few years left of this sentence. He also had years taken off of his sentence because he assisted police in the search to recover some of the victim's bodies, which means that just this year, in 2023, he is eligible for parole. Okay, that's great. According to Luis himself, he committed these crimes because he had made a deal with the devil and he explained that satanic ritual was involved in all of his crimes. In our number nine spot today, we have William Bonin. This horrible person is said to be responsible for taking the lives of 21 young men in Southern California from May of 1979 to June of 1980. It is said that on at least 12 of these occasions, he was assisted by one of his four known accomplices and it is even speculated that he might be responsible for 15 more of these crimes that evidence hasn't officially been able to connect him to. He was often referred to as the freeway killer because of the fact that most of the bodies were found along the freeway of Southern California. The police surveilled William until they could catch him in the act, which they did. In the beginning, he claimed innocence, but after receiving an impassioned letter from one of the victim's mothers, which asked him to please share the location of her son's body, he confessed his guilt. But 
He made sure to clarify that it wasn't so the mother could be at peace and her pain could be eased. No, of course not. Instead, he said, quote, I was dying for a hamburger and I knew if I went out with the cops, they would get me a hamburger. Right, just gonna take a moment and let that sink in. At his first trial, the prosecutor described him as, quote, the most arc evil person who ever existed. William was convicted on 14 of his crimes and was sentenced to death. He spent 14 years on death row before his sentence was carried out in 1996. In our number 8 spot today, we have Robert Hansen. Robert is often referred to as the butcher baker and his story truly is horrific. He is one of the most prolific serial killers in Alaska's history because for over a decade he would kidnap women and bring them into the wilderness where he would then stalk them like prey. The reason he got away with his crimes for so long is because outside of these horrifying crimes, he was just a soft-spoken baker. Robert was heading to church by day and prowling the streets by night. What led to the downfall of this horrible monster was a badass named Cindy Paulson, who was able to escape from Robert and was sure to leave evidence behind. She then went to authorities and told them what happened, and this led to a search warrant for Robert's property, which is where all the evidence they needed lied. Robert is believed to have taken the lives of at least 17 women, and in 1983 he was sentenced to 461 years and a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In our number 7 spot today we have Vicki Dawn Jackson. Vicki was a woman who worked as a nurse for a number of years. She first got her nursing license in 1989, but it wasn't until the 2000s when things took a seriously dark turn. Between December of 2000 and February of 2001, the hospital that Vicki was working for recorded a number of deaths that was unusual, it was a much higher amount. Most of these patients were in the age range of 60 to 100 years old. Of course, people just chalked this up to the advanced age of most of these patients, but a rumor began to spread that someone might actually be responsible. After this, the hospital's administrator noticed that a vial of a drug called Mivacron had gone missing. You might see where I'm going with this. As it turns out, the person responsible was Nurse Vicky, and she had at least 10 patients whose lives she took by giving giving them too much of this missing it was a muscle relaxant. Take in that this is 10 people between December and February. That is an unbelievable amount of people in a remarkably short amount of time. You might be wondering why she took these lives, and apparently she did it when she found those people rude or quote, too demanding. Okay, Vicky, get a different job then. I don't know. In our number 6 spot today we have Michael Bear Carson and Susan Carson. This couple is not one that anyone would want to encounter. The stories of these two come from the 80s. They were married, and on the outside they appeared just like a happy couple of harmless hippies. We all know, though, not to judge a book by its cover, in the end they would go on to become known as the San Francisco Witch Killers. Didn't know San Francisco held so many witches. Basically together the pair took the lives of three separate people between 1981 and 1983. They started off by killing their roommate, who Susan claimed was a witch, and said that she was stealing her quote, health, power, and beauty. They next killed one guy that they worked with on a farm because they said that he was a demon. The final person they took the life of unfortunately picked up the pair as they were hitchhiking, and they took his life because they claimed he was a quote, black witch, whatever that means. Essentially, they were just committing crimes against people that they claimed to be witches. The pair were each tried and convicted for each separate crime and are both serving sentences of 75 years to life. Neither of them have ever shown any kind of remorse for what they've done. Number five, banana theft. Thief, banana thief, theft, I don't know. Turns out bananas curse people, makes them do crazy things. This, uh, this next couple is pretty odd, here we go. Back in 2014, a Connecticut burglar drove his station wagon through the doors of a closed convenience store. He drove literally into a gas station got out, stole a single banana, they peeled and then ate the fruit, and then fled the scene. That's right, nothing else was taken, no cash. I mean, there's obviously significant damage that has to be taken care of now, but the banana, the lone single banana, why? This isn't Mario Kart, you can't just throw a peel down and then make a getaway, you're gonna get caught. It's 2022, my guy. Keep your bananas safe, folks, these people are sick. For example, number four, fruit fight. Florida resident Philip Joseph Smolsky was charged with assault and battery on his girlfriend for apparently using a banana to throw at her. Police were called on the morning of January 3rd, 2014, and Pasco County deputy noticed a red mark on the victim's head where she said she had been hit by a flying fruit. That's like the start of a cop's episode, you know? 
Just driving. Uh, 42, David, we're uh, actually responding now to a banana and pajamas over on uh, After David uh, Avenue. The arrest affidavit shows that the same deputy also found a banana in a nearby garbage can and that parts of the peel were found on the ground near where the girlfriend was sitting. Hmm, a clue. In addition to the domestic battery charges, he was also charged with attempting to resist arrest without violence. How do you resist arrest without violence? Just say no, like no thank you, politely a couple times? No, I'm okay, thank you. Police say that pepper spray then was used to apprehend Smolsky. Ouch. This is just like the origins of a villain story. Oh no, it's Mr. Potassium Man. He's like throwing banana peels. Ah, don't slip. Whip. Number three, tattoos tell all. Sometimes you get a tattoo to remember a person or a place or a time. Sometimes you get a tattoo of a mountain on your forearm because you like nature and being outside and that one trip that one time. Great, we get it, we love it. Every tattoo is meaningful in some way, sure. Well, thanks to those fond memories being drawn in ink, it was quite easy for California police to find the killer of a victim who had died four years prior. This killer, Anthony Garcia, decided to remember this horrible act after doing it by getting a tattoo of all the grim details right there on his chest. Yeah, police noticed the chest tats when taking Garcia's mugshot for another crime, much smaller than, you know, murder. And that's where the tattoo stuck out to the police. They're like, wait a minute, we've been here before. The Christmas lights, the bent street lamp near the liquor store. This was the exact scene where the body was found four years prior. There was even a helicopter that looked angry depicting Garcia's nickname, Chopper. Yeah, I have, I have a dragonfly for my mom. Yeah, I don't like needles. It's probably the only one. Number two, reverse Santa. Ah, the old reverse Santa, huh? The old chimney sweep. Apparently this is way more common than I thought. A Maryland man who was asked to remain anonymous, due to the ongoing case of course, is facing charges in court recently as the police had to respond to two calls from the same house. The family apparently heard scuffling and coughing in the middle of the night from behind their fireplace wall and decided to reach out to authorities. But they were already beat to the chase by the man stuck in their wall. Yeah, I'd stay anonymous too. That's embarrassing. Guy's just whispering directions to your house. Uh, yeah, it's uh, Bradshaw. <laughs> uh, Brad Bradshaw, Bravo, Romeo. Guy had to rat on himself. The fire department showed up, had to rip the wall down brick by brick to get Buddy out. Like you wasted everyone's time, man. The family's time, the first responder's time, your getaway driver's time. And these guys' mug shots, they're the best. They're always just covered in soot, like a bad Oliver production. I'd do anything. And finally, number one. Use current location. Gotta save the most bizarre for last, I guess. Kristen DaCosta from Massachusetts. She's clearly never seen the movie Disturbia. She's sleeping on it. She's sleeping on Shia LaBeouf. Kristen was court ordered to wear an ankle bracelet as part of her probation, but she luckily didn't know that the bracelet could track your whereabouts. Yeah, what did she think it was doing this whole time? She's like, okay, thanks. That's random, and then just committed crimes. This is why you have to watch Disturbia. Stop sleeping on Shia. Kristen had no clue that it was tracking her while she committed 17 break-ins. Yeah, homes all over Southern Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Bedford, Fairhaven. I mean, where does she get the energy, you know? <laughs> where does she find all that energy? So random. She didn't destroy anything at all. She just stole jewelry and then left. The police just watched her go spot to spot, tracking her down, just ping, 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 awesome. There she is, there she is now, great. One owner didn't even realize they'd been robbed. That's how fast Kristen was, so, you know. If only she didn't have that ankle monitor on the entire time, she would've maybe got away with one of the 17 that she tried. I can't hop one fence, let alone 17, that's insane. I'm kind of impressed. Don't do crimes, but that's that's a little impressive. Coming off ominous, our first killer has no name as he's never been caught. It's the Monster of Florence. The Monster of Florence is nameless and faceless, uncaught, and responsible for 16 graphic deaths between 1974 and 85. MO for Target was always consistent, a couple evidently engaged in what writer Douglas Preston called a national pastime in Italy, boinking in parked cars, since traditional Italians do live at home until they're married and Nona doesn't need to hear that. In 1981, crime correspondent Mario Spezzi started reporting on a death. He soon came to believe, like many, that the 
the crime was just one in a series. Spezza even came up with the name Il Monstro di Ferenzi, or the Monster of Florence, because giving them a nickname is step one, I guess. The only interaction the killer ever made with police was when one of the victims escapes, only after her partner is killed because she reverses the car and slams on the gas, propelling herself backwards into a ditch and catching a motorcyclist's attention, who believes he's witnessing a crash and not a current killing, and stops helping and stops to help, scaring the monster away before he performs his usual mutilations and finishes his victims. While the female victim does pass from her injuries later, the chief inspector lies to media saying that she regained consciousness before passing and told them some info in an attempt to get the killer to expose himself. On the afternoon following the statement's publication, a Red Cross emergency worker who had accompanied the police to the hospital was called by a man who claimed to be the killer and asked what the victim had said. The same emergency worker is later called again by the killer while on vacation in Rimini. The second call left the investigators baffled how the caller knew how to reach the man. There is so much to cover with this case, including the Sardinian connection theory, the multiple men who went to jail and were released for this crime, and the fact nobody's ever been caught. But I got more to talk about, so let's move on to... Maria del Carmen and getting head. Imagine your 61 year old neighbor comes banging on your door and when you open it she's carrying a black and red leather box and asks you if she can store it at your place because it's quote full of adult toys. Why? Her husband Jesus has disappeared and the police need to look for clues. Last thing she wanted as an elderly woman was the embarrassment of them opening that box, right? Neighbor's super chill and sweet says sure even though it's weird as hell and proceeds to have the box in her house for a while before it starts to smell because a summer's gone by. Which is the last thing you want from a box of adult toys that aren't yours stored in your house by an old lady. So the neighbor finally decides to look inside and it's insta regret. Amongst the vibes and the blow up dolls was the rotting boiled head of her neighbor's husband wrapped in tin foil, which apparently sent her into a full scale panic attack. Baby girl, I do not blame you. Jesus's relatives said they were always skeptical about Maria's claim that her husband went on vacation by himself and then broke his phone by dropping it in the bathtub. They later got text messages from different numbers, but didn't believe they were coming from the missing man. Their efforts to communicate with him verbally were also all unsuccessful. Anyone who's seen Catfish once can see through that. Maria did end up in jail. This may be the scariest on the list because it was the most preventable, failing Esmond Green. What would you do if someone walked into your hospital and collapsed on the waiting room floor? Yeah, I'd help them too. We all like to think that we would, that anyone would. But apparently employees of Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn didn't share this belief. After checking into Kings County Hospital in Brooklyn, New York, Esmond Green waited 24 hours for treatment. EMS workers had brought her to the center on the morning of June 18th. The hospital had said she was suffering from agitation and psychosis and was involuntary admitted after refusing medical review for her diagnosed schizophrenia. At 5.32 a.m., Esmond Green collapsed out of her chair and onto the floor convulsing. In some truly horrible camera footage, you see several patients and even nurses walk by without stopping to see what's happening. She stops moving at 6.07 a.m. Two security guards and a member of hospital medical staff can be seen on video stopping to look at Green briefly before just walking away. Close to 7 a.m., finally a nurse comes over, nudges her with her foot, then again, then checks her pulse, then the nurse calls for help. The hospital later tries to falsify medical records, make it seem as though she'd been without assistance for just 10 minutes. For security cameras, tell a different story, and the hospital fired six employees after their investigation. But yeah, before you ask, that lawsuit went absolutely crazy against that hospital. You can't just sleep or eat at anyone's house. My mom was sure to teach me that. People like Carl Tanzler are good reminders, since there was a body in his bed. Carl Tanzer was a radiology technologist at the hospital in Florida. In 1930, he met a Elena Milgro de Hoyos, who was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Tanzler became obsessed with Elena and saving her, reportedly showering her with gifts and told her that he loved her always. However, Elena made it clear she wasn't really interested. And although he wasn't actually a doctor, with her family's approval he tried out different remedies. But she dies anyway in 1931. Tanzler insists on paying for her funeral, complete with a large mausoleum. Her family consented, but they weren't aware that Tanzler alone 
would have a key to the mausoleum. He visits constantly, leaving gifts, installing a phone so he can talk to her through the wall, normal stuff. Two years later, Tansler removes Elena's body from the cemetery. He tries to preserve it by attaching her bones together with wire, placing wax soaked cloth over her skin, and sticking rags in her body to help keep its shape. He was seen purchasing women's clothing and perfumes. A young neighbor saw him dancing with what appeared to be a life-size doll through the window. And then he stopped visiting Elena's grave, too. Hmm, rumors spread that Tanzler was living with a corpse. And in 1940, those rumors reached Elena's sister, who goes there and confronts him with the whole sleeping with the disinterred body of my sister thing, and he happily shows her. Tanzler was deemed fit to stand trial after a psychiatric evaluation and charged with destroying a grave and removing a body without authorization. However, the charges are dropped because the statute of limitations expired. An insult to effing injury, poor Elena's remains. Before being laid to rest in an unmarked grave, her modified corpse is put on display at a funeral home where 6,000 people come to see it. Ugh. This guy incites pure rage in me and has from the day I first read this case. It's Xavier Dupont de Légence, the French F wit. I can't say it on here, but y'all can say it out loud for yourselves. It has a nice ring to it. Especially since this twit is a family annihilator, doing so in the name of money and ego. Xavier is on the run for killing his wife, four teens, and two dogs at their home at L'Oreal Alanti of Nantes in France before disappearing without a, tra without a trace in 2011. Xavier worked as a salesman and attempting to create several businesses over the year, all with little success, he owed money. He had been raised affluent and his wife had too and they'd spent their lives that way. The entitlement of a re the entitlement of their regal title inflated them beyond a point of living comfortably within their means and instead they overextended, aka they were broke. There were so many signs of what was to come to in July of 2010, Xavier emails friends writing that there might be accidents that happen to his family that he might be blamed for someday. Even if it's convincing, don't believe it. In January 2011, when his father dies, he inherits a 22 cal and a month later, having never used one, suddenly obtains a license for it. After another month, he begins taking the firearm to a range. He buys a silencer and as well drives hours to buy adhesives and plastic bags. Month after that, he buys cement, a shovel, and quick lime. And what gets a little confusing is between the nights of April 3rd and 5th, he picks off the family members while still going to dinners and movies with other ones. Seeing as everyone was killed execution style, would Agnes or one of the other teens not have heard something when someone else was taken? Between the panic of Agnes's family, a weird letter everyone receives where Xavier claims to be an undercover cop, and countless visitors banging on their unanswered door, police are reportedly sent back to this property. And finally, Xavier's letter tips them off, his comment to ignore the loose backyard gravel. Under it was his family and two dogs. Xavier remains missing to this day. This is the strangest thing on our countdown by a long shot, the horse. It's a rare kind of story that manages to walk that fine line between disturbing and hilarious. The Emmon Claw horse intercourse case was a series of incidents in 2005 involving Kenneth Pinion, James Michael Tate, and other unidentified men. So you may be wondering, hey Teresa, uh, how does this actually even happen? Great question. So, it starts when Pinion loses his ability to experience certain sensation in the body after a motorcycle accident, and he begins to seek out sexual extremism to fill that void. The internet's a deep and scary place, and on there, Pinion finds a community of men called zoos who would meet up in farms for communal weekends of animal fun. They train the horses to participate even, and I'm not going to tell you how, research this nightmare yourself. Pinion is killed on a farm northwest of Emmonclaw, according to Governor John Urquhart of the sheriff's office. He said that typically the men were horsing around with the same horse on the property of James Michael Tate, but on this particular night, it's my understanding the horse wasn't particularly receptive. So the men had to go elsewhere. Having snuck into a barn and gotten up to whatever they do, Pinion sustains internal injuries from this not usual horse and is dropped off naked from a speeding car in front of Emmonclaw Community Hospital on July 2nd of 2005, where he's declared deceased on site from colon perforation. Reported in the Seattle Times, it was one of the paper's most read stories of 2005. Pinion's death was rapidly prompted to enact the bill of Washington state legislature that prohibits both intercourse with animals and the videotaping of such an act with jail time and fines as penalties. Persecutors also later determined that the horses hadn't been injured. Meet the real life jigsaw, toy box killer. David Ray Parker became known as the toy box killer following the chilling discovery of a sadistic chamber in 1999. Dude went full jigsaw before any of the horror movies even happened. He soundproofed a truck trailer which he called his toy box where he he tore 
and assault victims, telling them exactly what he was going to do to them in explicit detail while they were restrained, and he even went as far as putting mirrors on the ceiling and walls because he wanted them to see what was happening. He didn't even kill all of his victims, rather when he was done with some of them he would heavily dose them with an intensely powerful drug and then drop him somewhere. One of his victims actually didn't remember what happened at all and thought she was having horrific reoccurring nightmares until she finally put the pieces together and realized what would happen and no one believed her. It's estimated he killed up to 60 victims in New Mexico. Many of the bodies were never recovered as they were just and dumped in undisclosed locations. Parker also made recordings of his victim's demise and showed no remorse for his crimes, explaining it was a source of entertainment that made me create these tapes. His final intended victim luckily managed to escape with her life after three days of agony and report David to police. What can only be described as despicable, the hi-fi slayings. They still shock today, and honestly they could probably top this list and really any others when it comes to true evil human beings. In 1974, three men, Dale Selby, William Ann, Andrew and Keith Roberts entered Hi-Fi Shop in Ogden just before closing time holding store workers 20 year old Stanley Walker and 18 year old Michelle Ansley hostage in the basement as they robbed the store. 16 year old Byron Nasbitt enters the store with impeccably wrong timing as he was running errands and was also taken hostage. Both Byron's mother Carolyn Peterson Nasbitt and Stanley fathers Oren Walker arrive at the store to look for their children who had yet to return for over an hour. Now they suffered the same captive fate. What happened is unimaginable and so some of the most unnecessary human violence that has ever happened. The robbers forced the group to drink corrosive drain cleaner in an ill attempt to end their lives. All it does is cause them agony and screams. This is the breaking point for it falling apart and the robbers panicked and really lost control. Their attempted methods of killing hostages became bizarre and bizarre and more ineffective. They shot at them, they brought a pen into the mix and put it through someone's ear. They just ended up choosing to finish loading the van and leave. That's right, they just leave. There's no police outside forcing them to do all this, there's no need to kill these people other than panic. The two surviving victims sustained permanent life changing injuries and these twisted killers were executed by lethal injection. The otaku killer may genuinely not have had a soul. His one true companion was his grandfather so when he died it wasn't totally strange to his family that Miyazaki transformed. Just not to this extreme. They reported he had begun spying on his little sisters and then he attacked them when he can, was confronted about it. At one point he even attacked his mother for an argument they had. Miyazaki then admitted that he had eaten some of his grandfather's ashes after he'd been cremated in order to feel closer with him. In August of 1988, just one day after his 26th birthday, he abducts his first victim, Mary Kano. For several weeks, the body decomposes and then he checks in on it periodically. Eventually, he removed parts of it to keep at home. He would also call her family and breathe deeply into the phone. Later, he sent them a note in a box full of their daughter's bone dust. When the police announce this on the news, he sends them another taunting letter. His second victim is abducted in October of 1988 and again left the body in the woods while he took the victim's clothing with him. Within the next eight months, the killer would escalate to two more and they would go missing in the same manners. Otaku would drink their blood and sometimes dine on their remains. The otaku killer was finally apprehended when he was attempting his fifth kidnapping. The girl's older sister tells their father of a strange man and the father goes and quite literally jumps Miyazaki to save his daughter. Mia gets away but idiotically returns to the park where his car was and the police ambush him. Miyazaki, who retained a perpetually calm, collected demeanor throughout his trial, appeared indifferent to his capture. When asked about his crimes, he blamed them on the rat man, an alter ego that lived inside him and forced him to do terrible things. He was given death penalty in 2008. The uncaught offender of California. Once unnamed, Joseph James D'Angelo was found to be the face of the original Night Stalker, an uncaught serial offender for a long series of home invasions in Sacramento in 1976. He's actually responsible for at at least three separate crime sprees throughout the state, each of which spawned different nicknames in the press before it became evident they were committed by one person. The Vasilia Ransacker, Eron's, the Night Stalker, followed by the original Night Stalker since Ramirez came along and snatched up that jazzy title. He frequently breaks into homes in the daytime prior to committing the attack and would do things like unload the household weapons, leave pieces of rope, remove screens from windows, cut phone lines. He'd also call the victims before and after their attacks. He was known for his taunting and threatening of both victims and police in obscene phone calls and written communications, and one of the more chilling instances is at a community meeting in Sacramento regarding the attacks. A man stands up and declares he would protect his wife if the attacker came to their home next. Lo and behold, that couple is victimized next. He was there and must have followed them home. In 1978, he begins attacking all throughout Northern California, and then in 79, he vanishes. In the late 1990s, DNA revealed he moved to Southern California and became a
killer starting December of 79 there. He committed 10 murders and ranged from the Goleta to Dana Point region. On April 24th of 2018, the state of California charged the 72 year old with eight counts of first degree based upon DNA evidence. Investigators identified members of D'Angelo's family through forensic genealogy. D'Angelo couldn't be charged with his 1970s essays, but he was charged with the 2018 ones and 13 kidnappings and abduction attempts. Number 10, the young czar. Being the leader of a nation is hard. I play a lot of city builders, trust me, I know. Being the leader of a nation whose people have been brutally oppressed by your family's dynasty for 300 years and in general living in very poor conditions, especially compared to the rest of the world, that's hard too, even harder. Nicholas II inherited the throne from his father, which sounds great, but in reality was a lot of pressure to do so. As it turns out, Russia was in need of drastic change, and they would get it from the people and a bald man with very pointy facial hair. A communist revolution saw the empire of Russia fall. 300 years of Romanov rule end overnight, as the Tsar was forced to abdicate his throne. So what's his crime? Well, not doing anything. Negligence. He did so much nothing that people had to do something. Number 9, Nero Steam. We've talked about Emperor Nero quite a lot on this channel, but that's because he's the down bad Roman Emperor who puts opulence in Pax Romana. It's hard to pinpoint an exact crime or moment from him, as he's the guy you think about when you think of Roman Emperors. However, his crimes against his wife Claudia Octavia are very notable. So when Nero was getting remarried, he had to get rid of Octavia. I mean, you can't, you can't have like 40 wives, wait, that's, you gotta get rid of her. But how? I mean, how do you get rid of a woman like that? He actually did the whole uh, James Bond villain thing where the victim gets placed into a trap. Uh, it's very crude, but theatrical, because remember, that's, theatrics are important, remember that, folks. Hence, Octavia was banished to an island where shortly after she was locked into a vapor bath, where she suffocated. Naturally, to make himself look better, uh, they made it look like uh, they made it look like she did it, not him. So yeah, what a great guy! What a what an absolute hero in that story. Definitely not a villain. Number eight, Abzal Khan. Everyone remembers King Henry VIII for doing what he did to his wives. A naughty slap on the wrist, naughty. Don't do that for shame. However, I would like to offer Abzal Khan as the alternative monster here. He, he didn't unalive a handful of wives like Henry, no, no. He actually managed to rack up a count of 63. Yep, you heard me right, 63. First off, I don't know how you have that many wives and or remember names, let alone birthdays and anniversaries. I would not do very well in that situation. Well, what's the reason for all this blood spilling? It's pretty horrible, actually. Simply because he was being invaded, and the guy who was invading him and winning was slightly nicer to women and was going to most likely give them a better life. Jeez, talk about if I can't have it, no one can. God. Number seven, Caligula's wife. I think in a healthy relationship, you ought to put your partner on a pedestal. Maybe your partner is drop dead gorgeous, a promising athlete, or really enjoys building Legos. Nice tie fighter, babe, way to go. Yeah. Emperor Caligula of Rome liked to put his wife on a pedestal, literally. And while on this pedestal, she was wearing nothing but her birthday suit. Oh boy. Well, all of his friends, politicians, generals got to gawk and stare at her. And in some weird goth power flex, he would oftentimes hold a knife to her and tell her that he could just end her life whenever he wanted because he can do that. Not to mention the guy had a complete narcissist complex, building statues of himself everywhere just so she can, like, oh great, there he is again. It's him again. Number six, Kangas Khan. I bring the man up again because he's responsible for so much loss. So much blood spill, so much pain. Sure, they were effective warriors and archers, but they were, they were brutal, dude, especially him. They took what they wanted when they wanted, and it's said that he was responsible for so many lives lost that it affected the carbon footprint of the planet. Dude, that's insane. That is literally insane. Also, to note his treatment of rather, uh, well, mistreatment of women. YouTube won't let me say much, but I can tell you that these ladies were not inviting him into their bedrooms. It wasn't, uh, wasn't good. As it stands today, because of his bedroom misconduct, his DNA still lives on. 
5% of men worldwide share his DNA. In our number 5 spot today, we have Lavina Fisher. You may have heard Lavina's name before, and that is because she made American history when she became the first female serial killer in the United States. Wow, what a title. Sure, her parents were proud. Lavina, along with her husband John, were accused of luring travelers into their inn in Charleston, South Carolina during the 19th century and then killing them so that they could take their belongings. The couple were known for their hospitality, and many unsuspecting travelers fell victim to their deadly scheme as a result. Some stories even suggest that they had a trap door in one of the guest rooms that led to a pit where they would dump all of the bodies of their victims. Despite the numerous accusations and suspicions surrounding the Fishers, they were never formally charged with the killing. However, they were eventually caught and convicted for highway robbery and sentenced to hang. In our number 4 spot today, we have Arthur Shawcross. This man is also known as the Genesee River Killer, and his crime spree began in 1972. In trying to navigate these online guidelines, I can't exactly say who he specifically targeted, but what I will say is that while everyone on this list is particularly horrible, Arthur's crimes were some of the worst of the worst, if you catch my drift. This story, however, is a little unlike some of the others today, because after the first two of his crimes, he was apprehended, but for some insane reason, they allowed him to have a plea bargain where he was allowed to plead guilty to just one charge of only manslaughter for which he served 14 years of his 25 year sentence. In the least surprising turn of events, once he was released on early probation, his real crime spree got started. He would go on to take the lives of 12 women from 1988 to 1989, and thankfully he was finally caught for these crimes and sent right back to prison. Of course, his initial early release was the subject of huge controversy, rightfully so, and Dr. Michael H. Stone, professor of psychiatry at Columbia University, called this early release, quote, one of the most egregious examples of the unwarranted release of a prisoner. In the end, Arthur passed away in prison while serving a 250 year sentence. He passed in 2008 after suffering a heart attack. In our number three spot today, we have the Hue Song serial killer. This is the name used to describe a notorious unsolved criminal case that occurred in South Korea during the late 1980s. The killer was responsible for taking the lives of at least 10 women in the city of Hwaesong between 1986 and 1991. The victims were all found, but there was little to no evidence left at the crime scenes. The case was highly publicized and became one of the most infamous serial killer cases in South Korean history. Despite a massive investigation and the arrest of several suspects, including a man who confessed to the crimes, DNA evidence ultimately exonerated all of them. The case remains unsolved to this day with many theories and speculations surrounding the identity of the killer. The Hwaesong serial killer case sparked significant changes in the way South Korea approaches criminal investigations though, including the establishment of a national DNA database and the implementation of more advanced forensic techniques. In our number 2 spot today, we have Franklin Dwayne Alex. Franklin is a man who had quite an insane crime spree that lasted for about 6 Six months in the 1990s. Although short, it was anything but sweet. The spree started off in August of 1997 in Houston, Texas, and over the course of this spree, Franklin took the lives of at least three people. He committed robberies, he harmed people, he attempted to take more lives where thankfully the people survived, he kidnapped people. Literally any serious crime he could commit during those six months, he was doing it. In the end, Franklin was caught and put on trial for his crime spree, and he received a sentence of death, which was carried out on March 30th, 2010. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have Dale Hausner and Samuel Dietman. Known as the serial shooters, the crimes these guys committed are definitely on the list of fears I have, which I'm pretty sure spawned from a Criminal Minds episode. These two were actively committing these crimes between May of 2005 and August of 2006, and basically, they were arsonists who would randomly set fire to objects, but they would also drive around and commit random drive-by shootings. That's the really scary part. The fire thing is also bad, don't get me wrong, but there's just something about completely random violence that absolutely terrifies me. In the end, a series of tips is what led investigators to identify the perpetrators of these horrible crimes, in particular one from a friend of Samuel who explained that Sam had actually confessed to some of the killings one night while drinking. In Dale's trial, he was found guilty of 80 out of the 87 felony charges that were brought forth, and that was all in one single trial. The charges included 
included the killings and attempted killings he had done, arson, animal cruelty, and the drive-bys. In the end, he was sentenced to death six times, and his brother, who was later found out to have assisted in some of the crimes, was sentenced to 25 years. Samuel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. While Dale sat on death row, he apparently asked to be put to death as soon as possible, and in the end, in 2013, he decided to take his own life. Samuel, however, remains in prison. Number 10, Boudica. She was very tall, the glance of her eye most fierce, her voice harsh. A great mass of the reddest hair fell down to her hips. Her appearance was terrifying. Sounds awesome to me. One of the most famous queens in British history, Queen Boudicca was originally co-ruler of the Iceni tribe of East Anglia, alongside her husband, King Prasitagus. That is, she was until the Roman governor of Britain at the time attacked. Prasitagus was killed and his lands and household were plundered by the Romans. Boudicca and her daughters were rather savagely treated as well. So much so that after the fact she rose up leading other tribes of Britons who banded together and decided to take the fight back to the Romans. The Britons captured the Roman settlement of modern day Colchester with the imperial agent fleeing to Gaul. They fought to London and to St. Albans, storming the cities and sending the defenders fleeing. The Britons desecrated the Roman cemeteries, mutilating statues and breaking tombstones. The Roman governor of Britain at the time, who had fled with his troops into the safety of the Roman military zone, challenged Boudicca with an army of 10,000 regulars and auxiliaries. Win the battle or perish, that is what I, a woman, will do. You men can live on in slavery if that's what you want. It's a pretty good quote. The battle was a brutal defeat though, with Boudicca taking poison to avoid becoming a prisoner. Criminal to the Romans, but I mean, a hero to pretty much everyone else. Number 9, Nefertiti. Kind of hard to call this a crime, but basically Nefertiti was the wife of the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep IV. Being close to equal in power to her husband, as well as very influential in her own right, she and her husband did something quite scandalous. They decided to turn their backs on almost the entire pantheon of Egyptian gods, sort of. They made one god the prime god of Egyptian religion during their reign. That would be the god of the sun, Aten. They moved the capital of Egypt to a new location, which they named after Aten, and they even both changed their names. He became Akhenaten, and she became, give me a sec here, um, Nefer Neferatau, nope, Nefer, <laughs> Nefer Neferaten, Nefertiti. There's like a hyphen in there, I don't know. Both of those names, as you may have noticed, have the name Aten in them. Nobody liked this change and it was quickly reverted after they were no longer in power. It sure was scandalous though. Number eight, Anne Boleyn. Honestly, for most of the wives of Henry VIII, it's a little hard to, well one, pick one, but also two, really know if any of the things they were accused of actually happened or if they were just easy excuses. But nonetheless, here we are, and since we haven't talked about any before, why not start with the second one, who was, was pretty much the catalyst for Henry VIII and England breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church and forming a whole new church resulting in the deaths of an eventual thousands of people. You see, divorce is strictly prohibited in the Roman Catholic Church, so when Henry met Anne, his wife Catherine, who had not produced him a son to carry his name, just kinda had to go prompting the whole damn reformation. Was it worth it? No, because the marriage lasted three years before she was charged with infidelity and incest and lost her head. I kind of feel bad for anyone associated with King Henry VIII though. Number seven, Queen Dida. Queen Dida of Kashmir was quite an ambitious queen mother. Dida seized complete administrative control during her husband's reign, ultimately becoming queen regent for her son and grandsons. That ain't enough for Miss Dita here. Mere advisory for her? No sir, she despised being just an advisor and well, she disposed of all three of her grandsons using medieval forms of witchcraft and torture. Yikes, how dare they make Gma their advisor. Queen Dita got what she wanted at least, as she then reigned as monarch for 23 years, being in some form of power for nearly the whole of Kashmir's 10th century. And while she may have been more than a little brutal, she was honestly one of the best and strongest rulers Kashmir has ever had. Number six, Queen Nandi. Queen Nandi of the Zulu Empire has a story that literally sounds like it's straight out of a movie. 
Before the Zulu Empire ever came to become a thing at all, Nandi was impregnated by a Zulu chief in the 1700s, giving birth to a son they named Shaka. But being the third wife of the chief, she and her son were often ridiculed and shamed by other chieftains. Despite all that, Nandi raised Shaka to be an extremely fierce warrior. Shaka grew up to become the Zulu chief in 1815, and Nandi became the queen mother alongside him, known in English as the Great She Elephant. She, alongside her son, wreaked havoc on those who had mistreated her and Shaka. But since Shaka remained unmarried, it was Nandi who, funnily enough, remained the power behind the throne of the Zulu Empire throughout her lifetime. She is the reason the Empire ever existed in the first place, and if any of what she did was a crime, uh, I kind of get it. In our number 5 spot today, we have Stephen Griffiths. This is a person who is said to have idolized the Yorkshire Ripper, so I'm sure what comes next will be no surprise. Stephen was a PhD student who wanted to achieve fame, but through the most sinister way possible. Between June of 2009 and May of 2010, he would go on to take the lives of three separate women. His criminal history was also extremely concerning, as years ago, he had been arrested due to an unprovoked attack on a grocery store manager, and it is said that he previously stated that he saw himself becoming a serial Shortly after he was arrested for his crimes, CCTV footage emerged that showed him celebrating after taking the life of his final victim. The footage showed him holding up a crossbow and giving the finger directly to the camera. It is said that Stephen pled guilty to his crimes once caught, not because he was remorseful, but because he wanted to receive the recognition for them. In our number 4 spot today, we have Joanna Denny. This is the person responsible for a series of killings and attacks that took place in March of 2013. Joanna is a very cold and very heartless person. Person and has, on many occasions, been said to laugh at her crimes and the lives she took, even still behind bars. After the first of her crimes, authorities launched a manhunt for her and they used CCTV footage to help track her down. She was finally caught after attacking two dog walkers who, thanks to immediate medical intervention, were able to survive. There are many, many things about this story that make it exceptionally chilling, and it seems as though most people Joanna encounters are left with quite an impression of what a horrible person she really is. On the day she was sentenced, it is reported that the judge, Mr. Justice Spencer, said, quote, Although you pleaded guilty, you've made it quite clear you have no remorse. He went on to say, quote, You are a cruel, calculating, selfish, and manipulative serial after this, he sentenced her to a whole life order, or life in prison without parole, and it is said that she smiled and laughed at this. Since her time in prison, she is said to have planned escape attempts that involved the killing of a prison guard and other terrifying ideas. In our number 3 spot today, we have Elizabeth Wetlaufer. Elizabeth is a former registered nurse and serial who is responsible for taking the lives of eight and attempting to take the lives of another six senior citizens who were under her care. With a total of 14 victims that either passed away or were harmed by her actions, she is now one of the worst serial killers Canada has ever seen. And not to mention how she was doing these things to vulnerable people that she was supposed to have devoted her life to taking care of. Her first victim who passed away was James Silcox, who was 84 in 2007 and was a World War II veteran. She committed her crimes by injecting insulin into her patients. In September of 2016, Liz ended up entering herself into a drug rehabilitation program at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which is located here in Toronto. It was here that she ended up confessing to her horrific crimes. Of course, the staff at the hospital notified the proper authorities, and she was subsequently arrested and she gave police a two-hour confession. She admitted to knowing what she did was wrong, but she also just said that she had urges she couldn't control. She stated that quote, God or the devil or whatever wanted me to do it. In the end, she was sentenced to life in prison, but because of the way that the Canadian system works, she will at some point be eligible for parole and hopefully denied. All right. In our number two spot today, we have Kevin Davis. The story behind this killer is truly one of the most disturbing things I have ever heard in my entire life. Kevin Davis was 18 years old when he took the life of his own mother. It seems as though there was some sort of conversation beforehand that had made him upset, which of course is never a good enough reason to do something like this, but there are details about this crime I wish that I could just unlearn. In an interview with police, he gives them an extremely detailed account of basically everything that happened and seems to show absolutely no remorse at all. It is chilling, it is disgusting, and it is honestly just horrific. During his trial, a doctor did testify to say that he had a personality disorder, but that he also fully knew the difference between right and wrong, and knew that his crime was wrong, and that there were no medical diagnosis that could 
could justify his actions. Kevin is still in jail where he will most likely spend the rest of his life, but he will become eligible for parole in 2044. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Axe Man of New Orleans. Unfortunately, this is not the name of some terrible horror flick, and instead it's the moniker given to a terrible, unidentified serial this person was active in New Orleans, Louisiana and its surrounding areas from May of 1918 to October 1919. As the name implies, those who were targeted by this person were usually attacked with an axe and it usually was one that actually belonged to the victims themselves. Many people believe that this person may have been targeting people of Italian descent because this was a theme among the victims and some also believe that he was mainly targeting women and only took the lives of men when they tried to intervene. This is actually something somewhat supported by the homes where women were killed but men weren't. In the end, although this person is responsible for taking at least 12 lives, exactly who the Axeman is or was remains a mystery. Number 10, Queen of Hating Her Daughter. Starting off this list with a bang would have to be the utterly despicable Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden. Queen Maria here seems to be guilty of the crime of attempted delifing. That's a pretty crazy thing for a queen, but it gets even crazier when you find out it was her own daughter who she tried to do this to. For some reason, when the queen gave birth to her daughter, who she wanted to be a son, she instantly thought of her sweet, innocent little daughter as a dark and ugly monster with black eyes. Gotta love coming into this world and being hated purely for existing. As she saw her as a monster, Maria tried to have her daughter dispatched multiple times and I don't know what this crime would be called, but she even forced her daughter to sleep next to the rotting corpse of her own father. Maybe that's the true crime here, because this is messed up. Number 9. Don't mess with the Empress The only powerful female emperor in the history of China has got to make you extremely ruthless, simply because you are a target and you would have needed to work to get to where you are. And you know what? Wu Zetian, who ruled during China's Tang Dynasty, was quite ruthless. She took her position of power by force, and she slayed many people in order to do so. But she didn't stop there. She committed more acts of slaying throughout her rule as well. And I don't mean like, slay queen, although that does really work for this list, but no, she slayed people. And we don't support that kind of criminal behavior, even if you are above the law. To make matters worse though, it is reported that even her mother and grandchildren fell onto that list of victims, all because they were against her. Truly a ruthless queen. Number 8. Mommy Issues Empress Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802, and she co-ruled with her son for two decades before leaving it all by herself. That's not a crime. But how she did so was a bit more, I don't know, just a little outside the realm of legality by today's standards. Her son, Emperor Constantine VI, was not a popular emperor, and the empress was quite an ambitious and greedy woman. She wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire, and to do that, with the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son. Poor parenting skills if you ask me, but hey, the two actually made up and were at least somewhat civil. That is, until Constantine divorced his wife and married his mistress, turning the people against him and giving Irene the opportunity to lead another conspiracy and then have her son's eyes gouged out. Yay! Number 7. Rana Valona I honestly didn't know Madagascar had queens or kings. That's not because it doesn't make sense, I, I'm, just, I'm just dumb. Thanks to me being a young child, I thought the only royalty Madagascar had was King Julian. You know, like the lemur? King Julian! Like that, that King Julian. Um, but they did have kings and queens, and one of these queens was pretty damn brutal. Queen Rena Valona I ruled Madagascar between 1828 and 1861, and there is absolutely no doubt that she would do anything for her kingdom. After King Radama I, her husband, passed away, she took over the crown, and during her reign, she put a lot of people to the axe, or whatever way they executed people in Madagascar. Her uncle was one who met the sticky end to protect her power. But some records state that Rena Valona ended her own mother's life by subjecting her to starvation. Rena Valona sent her mom to her room and didn't let her have dinner. Or any meals, really. That's never okay, and would get someone like us charged under the law with something. I don't know what exactly it would be, but it'd be something. Number 6. Pretty firmly against cheating. Not to be weird, but I can kind of see where this queen is coming from. At first. 
At first, I sort of get it, but not later on. Just at first. Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And even while on his deathbed, he begged his own wife, Queen Catherine de Medici, to allow him to see her. Kind of really disrespectful to your wife, but I guess he loved his mistress too. I, mm -mm. I'm kind of confused on the morals of this. However, the Queen was not confused on the morals and didn't give in to his plea. In fact, she even denied Diane entry into the room, letting the king pass away without having his dying wish granted. Damn. That ain't a crime. This queen had a daughter who took after her dear old dad when it came to the whole monogamous relationships, meaning she didn't really have them. When the queen mother found out about her married daughter's new romantic interest, she locked her daughter up in a castle and never saw her again. But she became even worse when she ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be executed in front of her. Now that is rough. And while she didn't do the deed herself, giving the order is kind of bad enough. It gets worse. Her son, King Henry, didn't like that she cruelly did this to her own daughter, so she had him dispatched as well. My goodness. Since we're talking historical crime, let's throw it back to the 18th century for Nathan Elglin, the servant girl annihilator. Now over 130 years in the past, few official records pertaining to the victims have survived, and the same can be said for Nathan Elglin, the proven yet unproven perpetrator. In July of 1884, there were two instances of women, both African American, being stabbed in the face as they slept. They both survived, and authorities investigated a separate incidence. In 1884, an African American woman is then struck in the head with a smoothing iron while she sleeps. She also survives. These nocturnal attacks, not fatal, were idiosyncratic in style that they must have been the beginning of a killer who would later escalate to more gruesome results. And that is the case. In 1884, they escalate again. The first one is simply an assault overnight, but literally the next day, an African American woman named Molly Smith is struck in the head with an axe. Molly Smith set a pattern for all that followed in 1885 as eight killings took place in Austin, Texas, all carried out pretty much the same way. And the axe would always be left behind and the bare footprints of the killer who was missing a toe on one foot was always on the scene. Meanwhile, Elgin had been getting in trouble since 1881 inciting attacks and carrying weapons, so when the police find him attacking a woman in 1886 Masontown, Austin, they're pretty okay with the fact they had to pop one in him to get him to stop. But the officer's shot didn't kill Elgin instantly. It did leave him paralyzed and mortally wounded and he died the next day. And a subsequent autopsy revealed that he, the bullet had gotten lodged in Elgin's spine. Sure, blah blah blah, it doesn't matter. But the doctors also noticed another detail. Elgin was missing a toe on the right foot and just like that they'd found their man. Catherine Knight made arrest herstory in Australia as the first woman to be given in pr life imprisonment no parole. Why? Well Catherine wasn't a great girlfriend. She started her long line of violent relationships with another co-worker David Kellett. Knight met Kellett in 1973 and the pair got married the following year when she tried to strangle him on their wedding night because he only had intercourse with her three times before he fell asleep. Then Knight was in a relationship with David Saunders and after meeting in 1986. He doesn't marry her which means he's in for a of her insanity. She cuts his dog's throat in front of him. She knocks him unconscious with a frying pan, burns his face with an iron, stabs him in the stomach with a pair of scissors. He finally leaves her and goes into hiding, and then she meets minor John Price in 1994. They're turbulent as hell and really hit a high, and really hit a high note in 98 when the pair got in a massive argument because Price didn't want to get married. Pissed, Knight videotaped a bunch of medical kits he had apparently stolen from work and sent the video to his boss. Price was fired from the job he had for 17 years, and yet somehow the final straw is only when she stabs him in the chest in the year 2000. On February 29th of the same year, he went to the magistrate's court on the way to work and took out a restraining order against her. He told his co-workers afterwards that if he didn't show up to work the following day, it's because she had killed him. Well, that same day, that night, Kathy, after the two of them bang one out and John falls asleep, attacks John Price, and after 37 stabs, he dies. She then, skills, she then skins him, hangs it from hooks around the house, and in the kitchen, police later discover baked potatoes and a pumpkin in the oven and a still warm pot with Price's head floating in it with zucchini and cabbage on the stove. Police had intervened, thankfully, before the children had gone home from school as Price's boss had called the police when he no-showed at work. In Australian first for women, Knight was sentenced
sentenced to life in prison without parole at her trial in 2001. She may be known as Cannibal Kathy or Australia's Hannibal Lecter, but Knight has a good reputation in her correctional facility, affectionately nicknamed Nana for her maternal tenderness. It doesn't even feel like it could be real, but it is Nazino Island Cannibal Hell. In the summer of 1933, thousands of Moscow citizens are rounded up by police and sent to live on a small swampy island in Siberia Ob's River. They were unwilling, unknowing settlers in Stalin's new social engineering plan to relocate millions of undesirables into remote areas where they would cultivate the land and develop self-sufficient communities. Like they would undoubtedly die, but hopefully they'd build some towns first. The first 3,000 arrived by barge on Nazino Island in May of 1933. They had no tools, food, or shelter, and conditions con deteriorated quickly with snow, frost, and rain. Still, more people kept arriving. Guards patrolled to pop anyone who tried to escape, and they'd distribute rye bread flour every four to five days, which people would mix with water and then eat, or simply inhale and risk suffocating on. But the most troubling was what the many island's inhabitants resorted to when starvation really set in. A woman from the island was being transferred to another camp and was brought to stay the night at the home of Fiofila Berlin, who said in an interview the woman's calves had been cut off. When he inquired what happened, she said they did that to me on the island of death. They cooked them off and they cooked them. When asked if he ate human meat, one island prisoner told interrogators, that's not true, I only ate livers and hearts, describing the process of making skewers or picking who to take from, those already close to gone. On the island, there was a guard, they were killing each other. There was a, on the island, there was a guard named Kostia Venikov, a young man, and he fell in love with a girl who had been sent there. He was courting her, protecting her, and one day he had to go away for a while, and he left her with his comrades to take care of her. But with all the people there, the comrades couldn't really do much. People caught the girl, tied her to a poplar tree and cut off pretty much everything they could. When Costilla came back she was still alive and he tried to save her but she'd lost too much blood. August 1933, the island's empty once more. It was evacuated just 13 weeks after the first colonialists arrived. And of the 6,700 prisoners brought there, 4,000 were missing or dead. Okay.